Section 1 Story of the Sultan al Yaman and his three sons. There was erewhile in the land of al Yaman a man which was a sultan, and under him were three kinglets whom he overruled. He had four children, to wit, three sons and a daughter. He also owned wealth and treasures greater than reed can pen or page may contain, as well as animals, such as horses and camels, sheep and black cattle, and he was held in awe by all the sovereigns. But when his reign had lasted for a length of time, age brought with it ailments and infirmities, and he became incapable of faring forth his palace to the divan, the hall of audience whereupon he summoned his three sons to the presence, and said to them, As for me, tis my wish to divide among you all my substance ere I die, that ye may be equal in circumstance, and live in accordance with whatso I shall command. And they said, Hearkening and obedience. Then quoth the sultan, Let the eldest of you become sovereign after me. Let the cadet succeed to my monies and treasures, and as for the youngest, let him inherit my animals of every kind. Suffer none to transgress against each other, but each aid each, and assist his co-partner. He then caused them to sign a bond and agreement to abide by his bequeathal. And after delaying a while, he departed to the mercy of Allah. Thereupon his three sons got ready the funeral gear, and whatever was suited to his estate for the mortuary, obesquities, and such ceremonies and other matters. They washed the corpse, and enshrouded it, and prayed over it. Then, having committed it to the earth, they returned to their palaces, where the wazirs and the lords of the land, and the city folk in their multitudes, high and low, rich and poor, flocked to condole with them on the loss of their father and the news of his decease was soon bruited abroad in all the provinces and deputations from each and every city came to offer condolence to the king's sons these ceremonies dully ended the eldest prince demanded that he should be seated as sultan on the stead of his sire in accordance with the paternal will and testament but he could not obtain it from his two brothers, as both and each said, I will become ruler in room of my father. So enmity and disputes for the government now arose amongst them, and it was not to be won by any. But at last quoth the eldest prince, When we and submit ourselves to the arbitration of a sultan of the tributary sultans, and let him to whom he shall adjudge the realm take it and reign over it? Quoth they, "'Tis well, and thereto agreed, as did also the wazirs, and the three set out without sweet, seeking the capital of one of the subject sovereigns. And Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased to say her permitted say. Then quoth her sister Danyazad, "'How sweet is thy story, O sister mine, and how enjoyable and delectable!' Quoth she, and where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the king suffer me to survive? Now when it was the next night, and that was the three hundred and thirtieth night, Danyazad said to her, Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy, finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night. She replied, With love and good will, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed, which is befitting of deed and fair seeming, and worthy celebrating, that the three princes fared seeking a sultan of the sultans, who had been under the hands of their sire, in order that they might take him to arbitrator. And they stinted not faring till the middle way, when, behold, they came upon a mead abounding in herbage and in rainwater lying sheeted. So they sat them down to rest and to eat their victual, when one of the brothers, casting his eye upon the herbage, cried, Verily a camel hath lately passed this way, laden half with halwa sweetmeats, and half with hamis pickles. True, cried the second, and he was blind of an eye, exclaimed the third, to sooth, and indeed he hath lost his tail. 
hardly however had they ended their words when lo the owner of the camel came upon them for he had overheard their speech and said to himself by allah these fellows have driven off my property inasmuch as they have described the burthen and eke the beast as tailless and one-eyed and cried out ye have carried away my camel by allah we have not seen him quoth the princes much less have we touched him but quoth the man by the almighty who can have taken him except you and if you will not deliver him to me off with us i and you three to the sultan they replied by all manner of means let us wend to the sovereign so the four hide forth the three princes and the cameleer and ceased not faring till they reached the capital of the king there they took seat without the wall to rest for an hour's time and presently they arose and pushed into the city and came to the royal palace then they craved leave of the chamberlains and one of the eunuchs caused them enter and signified to the sovereign that the three sons of such and such a sultan had made act of presence so he bade them be set before him and the four went in and saluted him and prayed for him and he returned their salams he then asked them what is it hath brought you hither and what may ye want in the way of inquiry now the first to speak was the cameleer and he said o oh, my lord the sultan verily these three men have carried off my camel by proof of their own speech and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with what i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and thirty-first night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the cameleer came forward between the sultan's hands and said o oh my lord verily these men have carried away the camel which belongeth to me for they have indeed described him and the burden he bore and i require of our lord the sultan that he take from these wits and deliver to me the camel which is mine as proved by their own words presently asked the sultan what say ye to the claims of this man and the camel belonging to him hereto the prince has made answer by allah o king of the age we have not seen the camel much less have we stolen him thereupon the cameleer exclaimed o my lord i hear yonder one say that the beast was blind of an eye and the second said that he was tailless and the third said that half his load was of sour stuff and the other half was of sweet stuff they replied true we spake these words and the sultan cried to them ye have purloined the beast by this proof they rejoined no by allah o my lord we set us in such a place for repose and refreshment and we remarked that some of the pasture had been grazed down so he said this is the grazing of a camel and he must have been blind of one eye as the grass was eaten only on one side but as for our saying that he was tailless we noted the droppings lying heaped upon the ground which made us agree that the tail must have been cut off it being the custom of camels at such times to whisk their tails and scatter the dung abroad so twas evident to us that the camel had lost his tail but as for our saying that the load was half halwa and half hamis we saw on the place where the camel had knelt the flies gathering in great numbers while on the other were none so the case was clear to us as flies settle on naught save the sugared that one of the panniers must have contained sweets and the other sours hearing this the sultan said to the cameleer o man fare thee forth and look after thy camel 
for these signs and tokens prove not the theft of these men but only the power of their intellect and their penetration and when the cameleer heard this he went his ways presently the sultan cleared a place in the palace and allotted it to the princes for their entertainment he also directed they be supplied with a banquet and the eunuchs did his bidding but when it was eventide and supper was served up the trio sat down to it purposing to eat the eldest however having hand in hand of bannock of bread exclaimed by allah verily this cake was baked by a woman in blood to wit one with the menses the cadet tasting a bit of kid exclaimed this kid was suckled by a bitch and the youngest exclaimed assuredly this sultan must be a son of shame a bastard all this was said by the youths what while the sultan had hidden himself in order to hear and to profit by the prince's words so he waxed wroth and entered hastily crying what be these speeches ye have spoken they replied concerning all thou hast heard inquire within and without will find it wholly true the sultan then entered his women's apartments and after inquisition found that the woman who had kneaded the bread was sick with her monthly courses he then went forth and summoned the head shepherd and asked him concerning the kid he had butchered he replied by allah o my lord the nanny goat that bare the kid died and we found none other in milk to suckle him but i had a bitch that had just pupped and her have i made nourish him the sultan lastly hent his sword in hand and proceeded to the apartments of the sultana mother and cried by allah unless thou avert my shame we will cut thee down with this scimitar say me whose son am i she replied by allah o my child indeed falsehood is an excuse but fact and truth are more saving and superior verily thou art the son of a cook and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister daniazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the king suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and thirty-second night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan's mother said to him verily thou art a cook's son thy sire could not beget boy children and i bear him only a single daughter but it also fortuned that the kitchener's wife lay in of a boy to wit thyself so we gave my girl babe to the cook and took thee as the son of the sultan dreading for the realm after thy sire's death the king went forth from his mother in astonishment at the penetration of the three youths and when he had taken seat in his palace he summoned the trio and as soon as they appeared he asked them which of you was it that said she who kneaded the bread was in blood quoth the eldest that was i and quoth the king what led thee to suspect that she was menstruous he replied o my lord when i took the bannock and broke off a bitcock the flour fell out in lumps now had the kneader been well her strength of hand would have remained and the bread would have been wrought by all the veins but when the blood came her powers were minished for women's forces in their hands and as soon as the monthly period cometh upon them their strength is lost their bodies contain three hundred and sixty veins all lying hard by one another and the blood of the catamenia floweth from them all hence their force becometh feebleness and this was my proof of the woman which was menstruous quoth the sultan tis well we accept as certain thy saying upon this evidence 
for it is agreeable to man's understanding nor can any challenge it this being from the power of insight into the condition of womankind and we are assured of its soothfastness for it is evident to us without concealment but which is he who said of the kid's meat that the beast was suckled by a bitch what proof had he of this how did he learn it and whence did his intelligence discover it to him now when the deceased sultan's second son heard these words he made answer i o king of the age am he who said that say the king replied tis well and the prince resumed o my lord that which showed me the matter of the meat which was to us brought is as follows i found the fat of the kid all hard by the bone and i knew that the beast had sucked bitch's milk for the flesh of dogs lieth outside and their fat is on their bones whereas in sheep and goats the fat lieth upon the meat such then was my proof wherein there is nor doubt nor hesitation and when thou shalt have made question and inquiry thou wilt find this to be fact quoth the sultan tis well thou hast spoken truth and whatso thou sayest is soothfast but which is he who declared that i am a bastard and what was his proof and what sign in me exposed it to him quoth the youngest prince i am he who said it and the sultan rejoined there is no help but that thou provide me with a proof the prince rejoined tis well and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that night was the three hundred and thirty-third night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youngest prince said to the sultan o my lord i have evidence that thou art the son of a cook and base born in that thou didst not sit at meat with us and this was mine all-sufficient evidence every man hath three properties which he inheriteth at times from his father at times from his maternal uncle and at times from his mother from his sire cometh generosity or niggardness from his uncle courage or cowardice from his mother modesty or immodesty and such is the proof of every man then quoth to him the sultan sooth thou speakest but say me men who like you know all things thoroughly by evidence and by your powers of penetration what cause have they to come seeking arbitration at my hand beyond yours there be no increase of intelligence so fare ye forth from me and manage the matter amongst yourselves for it is made palpable to me by your own words that naught remaineth to you save to speak of mysterious subjects nor have i the capacity to adjudge between you after that which i have heard from you in fine and ye possess any document drawn up by your sire before his decease act according to it and contrary it not upon this the princes went forth from him and made for their own country and city and did as their father had bidden them to do on his deathbed the eldest enthroned himself as sultan the cadet assumed possession and management of the monies and treasures and the youngest took to himself the camels and the horses and the bees and the muttons then each and every was indeed equal with his co-partner in the gathering of good but when the new year came there befell a drought among the beasts and all belongings to the youngest brother died nor had he aught of property left yet his spirit brooked not to take anything from his brethren or to even ask them aught 
this then is the tale of the king of al yaman in its entirety yet is the story of the three sharpers more wondrous and marvellous than just recounted and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the king would suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and thirty-fourth night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy of celebrating and she began to recount the story of the three sharpers section two the story of the three sharpers saying verily their adventure is wondrous and their actions delightsome and marvellous presently adding there were in time of yore three sharpers who were wont every day in early morning to prowl forth and to pray rummaging among the mounds which outlay the city therein each would find a silver bit of five paras or its equivalent after which the trio would foregather and buy whatso sufficed them for supper they would also expend to nus upon bast which is bang and purchase a waxen taper with the other silver bit they had hired a cell in the flank of wakala a caravansieri without the walls where they could sit at ease to solace themselves and eat their hashish after lighting the candle and enjoy their intoxication and consequent merriment till the noon a night then they would sleep again awakening at day dawn when they would arise and seek for spoil according to their custom and ransack the heaps where at times they would hit upon a silverling of five dirhams and at other times a piece of four and at eventide they would meet to spend together the dark hours and they would expend everything they came by every day for a length of time they pursued this path until one day of the days they made for the mounds as was their wont and went round searching the heaps from morning to evening without finding even a half para wherefore they were troubled and they went away and nighted in their cell without meat or drink when the next day broke they arose and repaired for booty changing the places wherein they were wont to forage but none of them found aught and their breasts were straitened for lack of a find of dirhams wherewith to buy them supper this lasted for three full told and following days until hunger waxed hard upon them and vexation so they said one to other go we to the sultan and let us serve him with the slight and each of us three shall claim to be a past master of some craft happily allah almighty might incline his heart uswards and he may largest us with something to expend upon our necessities accordingly all three agreed to do on this wise and they sought the sultan whom they found in the palace garden they asked leave to go in to him but the chamberlains refused admission so they stood afar off unable to approach the presence then quoth they one to other twere better we fall to and each smite his comrade and cry aloud and make a clamour and as soon as he shall hear us he will send to summon us accordingly they jostled one another and each took to frapping his fellow making the while loud outcries the sultan hearing this turmoil said bring me yonder whites and the chamberlains and eunuchs ran out to them and seized them and set them between the hands of the sovereign as soon as they stood in the presence he asked them what be the cause of your wrath one against other they answered o king of the age we are past masters of crafts each of us weeding an especial art quoth the sultan 
what be your crafts and quoth one of the trio o oh, our lord as for my art i am a jeweller by trade the king exclaimed passing strange a sharper and a jeweller this is a wondrous matter and he questioned the second and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased to say her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Danyazad, How sweet and tasteful is thy tale, O sister mine, and enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, And where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? now when it was the next night which was the three hundred and thirty-fifth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan asked the second sharper saying and thou the other what may be thy craft he answered i am a genealogist of the horse kind so the king glanced at him in surprise and said to himself a sharper yet he claimeth an astounding knowledge then he left him and put the same question to the third who said to him o king of the age verily my art is more wondrous and marvellous than aught thou hast heard from these twain their craft is easy but mine is such that none save i can discover the right direction thereto or know the first of it from the last of it the sultan inquired of him and what be thy craft whereto he replied my craft is the genealogy of the sons of adam Hearing these words, the sovereign wondered with extreme wonderment, and said in himself, Verily he informeth with his secrets the humblest of his creatures. Assuredly these men, and they speak truth in all they say, and prove soothfast, are fit for naught except kingship. But I will keep them by me, until the occurrence of some nice contingency, wherein I may test them then if they prove themselves good men and trustworthy of word i will leave them on life but if their speech be lying i will do them die upon this he set apart for them apartments and rationed them with three cakes of bread and a dish of roast meat and set over them his sentinels dreading lest they fly this case continued for a while till behold there came to the sultan from the land of ajam a present of rarities amongst which were two gems whereof one was clear of water and the other was clouded of color the sultan hent them in hand for a time and fell to considering them straightly for the space of an hour after which he called to mind the first of the three sharpers the self-styled jeweller and cried bring me the jeweller man accordingly they went and brought him and set him before the sovereign who asked him o man art thou a lapidary and when the sharper answered, Yes, he gave him the clear watered stone, saying, What may be the price of this gem? And Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased to say her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Danyazad, How sweet is thy story, O sister mine, and how enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and thirty-sixth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sharper took the jewel in hand and turned it rightwards and leftwards and considered the outside and pried into the inside after which he said to the sultan o my lord 
verily this gem containeth the worm bred within the heart thereof now when the king heard these words he waxed wroth with exceeding wrath and commanded the man's head to be stricken off saying this jewel is clear of color and free of flaw or other default yet thou chargest it falsely with containing a worm then he summoned the linkman who laid hands on the sharper and pinioned his elbows and trussed up his legs like a camel's and was about to smite his neck when behold the wazir entered the presence and seeing the sovereign in high dungeon and the sharper under the scimitar asked what was to do the sultan related to him what had happened when he drew near to him and said o oh my lord act not after this fashion and thou determine upon the killing of yonder man first break the gem and if thou find therein a worm thou wilt know the white's word to have been veridical but an thou find it sound then strike off his head right is thy reed quoth the king then he took in hand the gem and smote it with his mace and when it brake behold he found therein the worm a middlemost thereof so he marvelled at the sight and asked the man what proved to thee that it harbored a worm the sharpness of my sight answered the sharper then the sultan pardoned him and admiring his power of vision addressed his attendant saying bear him back to his comrades and ration him with a dish of roast meat and two cakes of bread and they did as he bade them after some time on a day of the days there came to the king the tribute of a jamland accompanied with presents amongst which was a colt whose robe black as night showed one shade in the sun and another in the shadow when the animal was displayed to the sultan he fell in love with it and set apart for it a stall and solaced himself at all times by gazing at it and was wholly occupied with it and sang its praises till they filled the whole countryside presently he remembered the sharper who claimed to be a genealogist of the horse kind and bade him be summoned so they fared forth and brought him and set him between the hands of the sovereign who said to him art thou he who knoweth the breed and descent of horses yea verily said the man then cried the king by the truth of him who set me upon the necks of his servants and who saith to a thing be and it becometh and i find aught of error or confusion in thy words i will strike off thy head hearkening and obedience quoth the sharper then they led him to the colt that he might consider its genealogy he called aloud to the groom and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and thirty-seventh night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sharper called aloud to the stirrup holder and when they brought him he bade the man back the colt for his inspection so he mounted the animal and made it pace to the right and to the left causing it now to prance and curvet and then to step leisurely while the connoisseur looked on and after a time quoth he to the groom tis enough then he went into the presence and stood between the hands of the king who inquired what hast thou seen in the colt o kashmar replied the sharper by allah o king of the age this colt is of pure and noble blood on the side of the sire its action is excellent and all its qualities are praiseworthy save one and but for this one it had been perfect in blood and breed nor had there been on earth's face its fellow in horse-flesh 
but its blemish remaineth a secret. The sultan asked, And what is the quality which thou blamest? And the sharper answered, Tis sire was noble, but its dam was of other strain. She it was that brought the blemish, and if thou, O my lord, allow me, I will notify it to thee. Tis well, and needs must thou declare it, quoth the sultan. Then said the sharper, Its dam is a buffalo cow. When the king heard these words, he was wroth with wrath exceeding, and he bade the linkman take the sharper and behead him, crying, O dog, O accursed, how can a buffalo cow bear a horse? The sharper replied, O my lord, the linkman is in the presence, but send and fetch him who brought thee the colt, and of him make inquiry. If my words prove true and rightly placed, my skill shall be established. But an they be lies, let my head pay forfeit for my tongue. Here standeth the linkman, and I am between thy hands. Thou hast but to bid him strike off my head. Thereupon the king sent for the owner and breeder of the colt, and they brought him to the presence. And Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased to say her permitted say. Then quoth the sister, Danyazad, How sweet is thy story! O sister mine, and how enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, And where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? Now when it was the next night, and that was the three hundred and thirty-eighth night, Danyazad said to her, Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy, Finish for us thy tale, that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night. She replied, With love and good will. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed, which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming, and worthy celebrating, that the sultan sent for the owner and breeder of the colt, and asked him, saying, Tell me the truth, anent the blood of this colt, didst thou buy it or breed it, so that it was a rearling of thy homestead? Said he, By Allah, O king of the age, I will speak not which is not sooth, for indeed there hangeth by this colt the strangest story. Were it graven with graver needles upon the eye corners, it had been a warning to whoso would be warned. And this it is. I had a stallion of purest strain, whose sire was of the steeds of the sea. And he was stabled in a stall apart for fear of the evil eye, his service being entrusted to trusty servants. But one day in springtide the size took the horse into the open, and there pickwitted him, when behold, a buffalo cow walked into the enclosed pasture where the stallion was tethered, and seeing her he brake his heel ropes and rushed at her and covered her. She conceived by him, and when her days were completed, and her throwing time came, she suffered sore pains and bare yonder colt. And all who have seen it, or have heard of it, were astounded, said he, presently adding, By Allah, O king of the age, had his dam been of the mere kind, the colt would have had no equal on earth's surface, or aught approaching it. Hereat the sultan took thought and marveled, then summoning the sharper, he said to him when present, O man, thy speech is true, and thou art indeed a genealogist in horse-flesh, and thou wottest it well. But I would know what proved to thee that the dam of this colt was a buffalo cow. Said he, O king, my proof thereof was palpable, nor can it be concealed from any wide of right wits and intelligence and special knowledge. For the horse's hoof is round, whilst the hoofs of buffaloes are elongated and duck-shaped. And hereby I ken that this colt was Jumart, the issue of a cow-buffalo. The sultan was pleased with his words, and said, Ration him with a plate of roast meat and two cakes of bread. And they did as they were bidden. Now for a length of time the third sharper was forgotten, till one day the sultan bethought him of the man who could explain the genealogy of Adam's sons. So he bade fetch him, and when they brought him into the presence, he said, Thou art he that knowest the caste and descent of men and women? 
and the other said yes then he commanded the eunuchs take him to his wife and place him before her and cause him declare her genealogy so they led him in and set him standing in her presence and the sharper considered her for a while looking from right to left then he fared forth to the sultan who asked him what hast thou seen in the queen answered he o my lord i saw a somewhat adorned with loveliness and beauty and perfect grace with fair stature of symmetrical trace and with modesty and fine manners and skilful case and she is one in whom all good qualities appear on every side nor is aught of accomplishments or knowledge concealed from her and haply in her centre all desirable attributes nathless o king of the age there is a curious point that dishonoureth her from the which were she free none would outshine her of all the women of her generation now when the sultan heard the words of the sharper he sprang hastily to his feet and clapping hand upon hilt barred his brand and fell upon the man proposing to slay him and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and thirty-ninth night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan fell upon the sharper with his sword proposing to slay him but the chamberlains and the eunuchs prevented him saying o our lord kill him not until his falsehood or his fact shall be made manifest to thee the sultan said to him what then appeared to thee in my queen he is fairly fair said the man but his mother is a dancing girl a gypsy the fury of the king increased hereat and he sent to summon the inmates of his harem and cried to his father-in-law unless thou speak me sooth concerning thy daughter and her descent and her mother i he replied by allah o king of the age not saveth a man save soothfastness her mother indeed was a gazia in past time a party of the tribe was passing my abode when a young maid strayed from her fellows and was lost they asked no questions concerning her so i lodged her and bred her in my homestead till she grew up to be a great girl and the fairest of her time my heart would not brook her wiving with any other so i wedded her and she bare me this daughter whom thou o king has espoused when the sultan heard these words the flame in his heart was quenched and he wondered at the subtlety of the sharper man so he summoned him and asked him saying o wily one tell me what certified to thee that my queen had a dancing girl a gypsy to mother he answered o king of the age verily the gazia race hath eyeballs intensely black and bushy brows whereas other women than the gazia have the reverse of this on such wise the king was convinced of the man's skill and he cried ration him with a dish of roast meat and two scones they did as he bade and the three sharpers tarried with the sultan a long time till one day when the king said to himself verily these three men have by their skill solved every question of genealogy which i proposed to them first the jeweller proved his perfect knowledge of gems secondly the genealogist of the horse kind showed himself as skilful and the same was the case with the genealogist of mankind for he discovered the origin of my queen and the truth of his words appeared from all quarters now tis my desire he do the same with me that i also know my provenance accordingly they set the man between his hands and he said to him 
o fellow hast thou the power to tell me mine origin said the sharper yes o my lord i can trace thy descent but i will so do only upon a condition to wit that thou promise me safety after what i shall have told thee for the saw saith whilst sultan sitteth on throne where his despite inasmuch as none may be contumacious when he saith smite thereupon the sultan told him thou hast a promise of immunity a promise which shall never be falsed and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fortieth night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan pledged his word for the safety of the sharper with the customary kerchief and the man said o king of the age when as i acquaint thee with thy root and branch let it be between us twain lest these present hear us wherefore o man asked the sultan and the sharper answered o my lord allah of all might hath among his names the veiler wherefore the king bade his chamberlains and eunuchs retire so that none remained in the place save those two then the sharper came forward and said o my lord thou art a son of shame and an issue of adultery as soon as the king heard these words his case changed and his color waxed wan and his limbs fell loose he foamed at the mouth he lost hearing and sight he became as one drunken without wine and he fell fainting to the ground after a while he recovered and said to the sharper now by the truth of him who hath set me upon the necks of his servants and thy words be veridical and i ascertain their sooth by proof positive i will assuredly abdicate my kingdom and resign my realm to thee because none deserveth it save thou and it becometh us least of all and every but an i find thy speech lying i will slay thee he replied hearing and obeying and the sovereign rising up without stay or delay went inside to his mother with grip on glaive and said to her by the truth of him who uplifted the lift above the earth and thou answer me not with the whole truth in whatso i ask thee i will cut thee to little bits with this blade she inquired what dost thou want with me and he replied whose son am i and what may be my descent she rejoined although falsehood be an excuse fact and truth are superior and more saving thou art indeed the very son of a cook the sultan that was before thee took me to wife and i cohabited with him a while of time without my becoming pregnant by him or having issue and he would mourn and groan from the core of his heart for that he had no seed nor girl nor boy neither could he enjoy aught of sweet food or sleep now he had about the palace many caged birds and at last one day of the days the king longed to eat somewhat of poultry so he went into the court and sent for the kitchener to slaughter one of the fowls and the man applied himself to catching it at that time i had taken my first bath after the monthly ailment and quoth i to myself if this case continue with the king he will perish and the kingdom will pass from us and the shaitan tempted me to that which displeased allah and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable 
quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-first night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the queen continued and satan tempted me and made the sin fair in my sight so i went up to the kitchener attired and adorned as i was in my finest apparel and i fell adjusting with him and provoking him and disporting with him till his passions were excited by me so he tumbled me at that very hour after which he arose and slaughtered one of the birds and went his ways then i bade the handmaid sprinkle water on the fowl and clean it and cook it and they did my bidding after a while symptoms of pregnancy declared themselves in me and became evident and when the king heard that his queen was with child he waxed gladsome and joyful and gave alms and scattered gifts and bestowed robes upon his officers of state and others till the day of my delivery and i bear a babe which is thyself now at that time the sultan was hunting and birding and enjoying himself about the gardens all of his pleasure at the prospect of becoming a father and when the bearer of good news went to him and announced the birth of a man-child he hurried back to me and forthright bade them decorate the capital and he found the report true so the city adorned itself for forty days in honour of its king such is my case and my tale thereupon the king went forth from her to the sharper and bade him doff his dress and when this had been done he doffed his own raiment and habited the man in royal gear and hooded him with the talisman and asked him saying what proof hast thou of my being a son of adultery the sharper answered o my lord my proof was thy bidding our being rationed after showing the perfection of our skill with a dish of roast meat and two scones of bread whereby i knew thee to be of cook's breed for the kings be wont in such case to make presents of money and valuables not of meat and bread as thou didst and this evidence thee to be a bastard king he replied sooth thou sayest and then robed him with the rest of his robes including the kalansua or royal headdress under the hood and seated him upon the throne of his estate and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-second night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan enthroned the sharper upon the throne of the state and went forth from him after banding all his women to him and assumed the garb of a darwish who wandereth about the world and formerly abdicated his dominion to his successor but when the sharper king saw himself in this condition he reflected and said to himself summon thy will home comrades and see whether they recognize thee or not so he caused them to be set before him and conversed with them then perceiving that none knew him he gifted them and sent them to gang their gate 
and he ruled his realm and bade and forbade and gave and took away and was gracious and generous to each and every of his lieges so that the people of that region who were his subjects blessed him and prayed for him such was the case with the sharper but as for the sultan who fared forth in the habit of a darwish section three the sultan who fared forth in the habit of a darwish he ceased not wayfaring as become a wanderer till he came to cairo city whose circuit was a march of two and a half days and which then was ruled by her own king mohammedite he found the folk in safety and prosperity and good ordinance and he solaced himself by strolling about the streets to the right and left and he diverted his mind by considering the crowds and the world of men contained in the capital until he drew near the palace when suddenly he sighted the sultan returning from the chase and from taking his pleasure seeing this the darwish retired to the wayside and the king happening to glance in that direction saw him standing and discerned in him the signs of former prosperity so he said to one of his suite take yon man with thee and entertain him till i send for him his bidding being obeyed he entered the palace and when he had rested from the fatigues of the way he summoned the faker to the presence and questioned him of his condition saying thou from what land art thou he responded o my lord i am a beggar man and the other rejoined there is no help but thou tell me what brought thee hither the darwish retorted o my lord this may not be save in privacy and the other exclaimed be it so for thee the twain then rose and repaired to a retired room in the palace and the faker recounted to the sultan all that had befallen him since the loss of his kingship and also how he a sultan had given up the throne of his realm and had made himself a darwish the sovereign marvelled at his self-denial in yielding up the royal estate and cried laud be to him who degradeth and upraiseth who honoureth and humbleth by the wise ordinance of his all might presently adding o darwish i have passed through an adventure which is marvellous indeed tis one of the wonders of the world which i needs must relate to thee nor from thee withhold aught thereof and he fell to telling and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-third night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the king fell to telling the beggar man the history of mohammed sultan of cairo section four the history of mohammed sultan of cairo i began my career in the world as a darwish an asker owning naught of the comforts and conveniences of life till at length one day of the days i became possessor of just ten silverlings and no more which i resolved to expend upon myself accordingly i walked into the bazaar purposing to purchase somewhat of provant while i was looking around i espied a man passing by and leading in an iron chain a dog-faced baboon and crying haraj this ape is for sale at the price of ten fadas the folk jibed at the man and jeered at his ape but quoth i to myself buy this beast and expend upon it the ten silverlings accordingly i drew near the seller and said to him take these ten fadas whereupon he took them and gave me the ape which i led to the cell wherein i dwelt 
then i opened the door and went in with my bargain but began debating in my mind what to do and said how shall i manage a meal for the baboon and myself while i was considering behold the beast was suddenly transformed and became a young man fair of favor who had no equal in loveliness and stature and symmetric grace perfect as the moon at full on the fourteenth night and he addressed me saying o sheikh mohammed thou hast bought me with ten fadas being all thou hadst and art debating how we shall feed i and thou quoth i what art thou and quoth he query me no questions concerning whatso thou shalt see for good luck hath come to thee then he gave me an ashrafi and said take this piece of gold and fare thee forth to the bazaar and get us somewhat to eat and drink i took it from him and repairing to the market purchased whatso food our case required then returning to the cell set the victual before him and seated myself by his side so we ate our sufficiency and passed that night i and he in the cell and when allah caused the morn to dawn he said to me o man this room is not suitable to us hide thee and hire a larger lodging i replied to hear is to obey and rising without stay or delay went and took a room more roomy in the upper part of the wakala thither we removed i and the youth and presently he gave me ten dinars more and said go to the bazaar and buy thee furniture as much as is wanted accordingly i went forth and bought what he ordered and on my return i found before him a bundle containing a suit of clothes suitable for the kings these he gave to me desiring that i hie me to haman and don them after bathing so i did his bidding and washed and dressed myself and found in each pocket of the many pockets a hundred gold pieces and presently when i had donned the dress i said to myself am i dreaming or wide awake then i returned to the youth in the room and when he saw me he rose to his feet and commended my figure and seated me beside him presently he brought up a bigger bundle and bade me take it and repair to the sultan of the city and at the same time ask his daughter in marriage for myself and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-fourth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan of cairo continued so i took it and repaired with it to the king of that city and a slave whom the youth had bought bore the bundle now when i approached the palace i found there about the chamberlains and eunuchs and lords of the land so i drew near them and when they saw me in that suit they approved my appearance and questioned me saying what be thy business and what dost thou require i replied my wish is to have audience of the king and they rejoined wait a little while till we obtain for thee his permission then one of the ushers went in and reported the matter to the sultan who gave orders to admit me so the man came out and led me within and on entering the presence i salaamed to the sovereign and wished him welfare and presently set before him the bundle saying o king of the age this be in the way of a gift which besitteth my station not thine estate the sultan bade the package be spread out and he looked into it and saw a suit of royal apparel whose like he never had owned he was so astonished at the sight and said in his mind by allah i possess not like this 
nor was i ever master of so magnificent a garment presently adding it shall be accepted o sheik but needs must thou have some want or requisition from me i replied o king of the age my wish is to become thy connection through that lady concealed and pearl unrevealed thy daughter when the sultan heard these words he turned to his wazir and said counsel me as to what i should do in the matter of this man said he o king of the age show him thy most precious stone and say to him and thou have a jewel evening this one it shall be my daughter's marriage dowry the king did as he was advised whereat i was wild with wonderment and asked him and i bring thee such a gem wilt thou give me the princess he answered yea verily and i took my leave bearing with me the jewel to the young man who was awaiting me in the room he inquired of me hast thou proposed for the princess and i replied yes i have spoken with the sultan concerning her when he brought out this stone saying to me and thou have a jewel evening this one it shall be my daughter's marriage dowry nor hath the sultan power to false his word the youth rejoined this day i can do naught but to-morrow inshallah i will bring thee ten jewels like it and these thou shalt carry and present to the sovereign accordingly when the morning dawned he arose and fared forth and after an hour or so he returned with ten gems which he gave me i took them and repaired with them to the sultan and entering the presence i presented to him all the ten when he looked upon the precious stones he wondered at their brilliant water and turning to the wazir again asked him how he should act in this matter replied the minister o king of the age thou requiredest of him but one jewel and he hath brought thee ten tis therefore only right and fair to give him thy daughter and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-fifth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the minister said to the monarch give him thy daughter accordingly the sultan summoned the kazis and the effendis who wrote out the marriage contract between me and the princess then i returned to the youth who had remained in the room and told him all that had occurred when he said twere best to conclude the wedding ceremony and pay the first visit to thy bride at once but thou shalt on no wise consummate the nuptials until i bid thee go in unto her after somewhat shall have been done by me hearing and obeying replied i and when the night of the going in came i visited the sultan's daughter but sat apart from her by the side of the room during the first night and the second night and the third nor did i approach her although every day her mother came and asked her the usual questions and she answered he hath never approached me so she grieved with sore grief for that tis the want of womankind when a maid is married and her groom goeth not in unto her to deem that happy folk will attribute it to some matter which is not wholly right after the third night the mother reported the case to her father who cried this night except he abate her pusilage i will slay him the tidings reached my bride who told all to me so i repaired to the young man and acquainted him therewith he cried when thou shalt visit her say by allah i will not enjoy thee unless thou give me the amulet bracelet hanging to thy right shoulder i replied to hear is to obey 
and when i went in to her at nightfall i asked her dost thou really desire me to futter thee she answered i do indeed so i rejoined then give me the amulet bracelet hanging over thy right shoulder she arose forthright and unbound it and gave it to me whereupon i bled her of the hymeneal blood and going to the young man gave him the jewel then i returned to my bride and slept by her side till the morning when i awoke and found myself lying outstretched in my own caravansary cell i was wonderstruck and asked myself am i on awake or in a dream and i saw my whilom garments the patched gabardine and tattered shirt alone with my little drum but the fine suit given to me by the youth was not on my body nor did i espy any sign of it anywhere so with fire burning in my heart after what had befallen me i wandered about crowded sights and lone spots and in my distraction i knew not what to do whither to go or whence to come when lo and behold i found sitting in an unfrequented part of the street a magrabi a barbary man who had before him some written leaves and was casting omens for sundry bystanders seeing this state of things i came forward and drew near him and made him a salaam which he returned then after considering my features straightly he exclaimed o oh, sheikh hath that accursed done it and torn thee from thy bride yes i replied hereupon he said to me wait a little while and he seated me beside him then as soon as the crowd dispersed he said o oh, sheikh the baboon which thou boughtest for ten silver bits and which was presently transformed into a young man of adam's sons is not a human of the sons of adam but a jenny who is enamoured with the princess thou didst wed however he could not approach her by reason of the charmed bracelet hanging from her right shoulder wherefore he served thee this slight and won it and now he still weareth it but i will soon work his destruction to the end that jinn kind and mankind may rest from his mischief for he is one of the rebellious and misbegotten imps who break the law of our lord solomon upon whom be the peace presently the magrabi took a leaf and wrote upon it as it were a book and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-sixth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the magrabi wrote a writ and signed his name within and sealed it after which he handed it to me saying o oh, sheikh take this missive and hie thee herewith to a certain spot where thou must wait and observe those who pass by hearten thy heart and when thou shalt see approaching thee a man attended by a numerous train present to him this scroll for tis he who will win for thee thy wish i took the note from the barbary man and fared forth to the place which he had described and ceased not faring until i reached it after travelling all that night and half the next day then i sat down till darkness set in to await whatso might befall me when a fourth part of the night had passed a dazzling glare of light suddenly appeared from afar advancing towards me and as it shone nearer i made out men bearing flambeaux and lanthorns also a train of attendants befitting the kings they looked on and considered me whilst my heart fluttered with fear and i was in sore affright but the procession defiled and drew off from before me marching two after two and presently appeared the chief courtage wherein was a sultan of the yan 
as he neared me i heartened my heart and advanced and presented to him the letter which he having halted opened and read aloud and it was be it known to thee o sultan of the un that the bearer of this our epistle hath a need which thou must grant him by destroying his foe and if opposition be offered by any we will do the opponent die and thou fail to relieve him thou wilt know to seek from me relief for thyself when the king of the yan had read the writ and had mastered its meaning and its mysteries he forthwith called out to one of his sergeants who at once came forward and bade him bring into his presence without delay such and such a genie who by his spells had wrought round the daughter of the kyrene sultan the messenger replied hearing and obeying and departed from him and disappearing was absent an hour or thereabouts after which he and others returned with the genie and set him standing before the king who exclaimed wherefore o accursed hast thou wrought ill to this man and done on this wise and on that wise he replied o my lord all came of my fondness for the princess who wore a charm in her armlet which hindered my approaching her and therefore i made use of this man to effect my purpose i became master of the talisman and won my wish but i love the maiden and never will harm her now when the sultan heard these words he said thy case can be after one of two fashions only either return the armlet that the man may be reunited with his wife and she with her husband as wilhelm they were or contrary me and i will command the headsman strike thy neck now when the jinni heard this speech and twas he who had assumed the semblance of a dog-faced baboon he refused and was rebellious to the king and cried i will not return the armlet nor will i release the damsel for none can possess her save myself and having spoken in this way he attempted to flee and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-seventh night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the merit would fain have fled from before the king of the yon but the sovereign bade other merits and more forceful arrest him so they seized him and pinioned him and bound him in chains and collar and dragged him behind the king of the yon till the latter had reached his place and had summoned him and had taken from him the armlet then the sultan gave order for him to be slain and they slew him when this was done i prayed for the charm armlet and i recovered it after the merid's death they also restored to me my fine suit so i proceeded to the city which i entered and as soon as the guards and courtiers saw me they cried out for joy and said this is the son-in-law of the sultan who was lost hereat all the lieges hurried up to me and received me with high respect and greeted me but after entering the palace i proceeded forthright till i reached the apartment set apart by them for myself and my spouse whom i found in a deep sleep and stupefied as it were a condition in which she had lain ever since i took from her the talismanic armlet so i replaced the jewel upon her right shoulder and she awoke and arose and ordered herself whereat her father and family and the lords of the land and all the folk joyed with exceeding joy after this we lived together in all happiness till the death of her sire who having no son named me his successor so that i became what i am 
now when the darwi sultan heard all this he was astounded at what happeneth in this world of marvels and miracles upon which i said to him o my brother wonder not for whatso is predetermined shall perforce be carried out but thou needs must become my wazir because thou art experienced in rule and governance and since what time my sire-in-law the sultan died i have been perplexed in my plight being unable to find me a minister who can administer the monarchy so do thou become my chief counsellor in the realm thereupon the darwish replied hearkening and obedience the sultan then robed him in a sumptuous robe of honour and committed to him his seal ring and all other matters pertinent to his office at the same time setting apart for him a palace spacious of corners which he furnished with splendid furniture and wadded carpets and vessel and other such matters so the wazir took his seat of office and held a divan or council of state forthright and commanded and countermanded and bade and forbade according as he saw just and equitable and his fame for equity and justice was dispread abroad insomuch that whoever had a cause or request or other business he would come to the wazir for ordering whatso he deemed advisable in this condition he continued for many years till on a day of the days the sultan's mind was depressed upon this he sent after the minister who attended at his bidding when he said o wazir my heart is heavy enter then replied the minister o king into thy treasury of jewels and rubies and turn them over in thy hands and thy breast will be broadened the sultan did accordingly but it took no effect upon his ennui so he said o wazir i cannot win free of this melancholic humour and nothing pleasureth me in my palace so let us fare forth i and thou in disguise hearing is obeying quoth the minister the twain then retired into a private chamber to shift their garb and habited themselves as darwishes the darwishes of amjanland and went forth and passed through the city right and left till they reached uh, maristan a hospital for lunatics here they found two young men one reading the koran the other hearkening to him both being in chains like men jinn mad and the sultan said in his mind by allah this is a marvellous case and bespake the men asking are ye really insane they answered saying no by allah we are not daft but so admirable are our adventures that they are graven with needle gravers upon the eye corners they have been warners to whoso would be warned what are they quoth the king and quoth they each of us by allah hath his own story and presently he who had been reading exclaimed o king of the age hear my tale and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and forty-eighth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth began relating to the sultan the story of the first lunatic section five the story of the first lunatic i was a merchant and kept a shop wherein were hindi goods of all kinds and colours high most priced articles and i sold and bought with much profit i continued in this condition a while of time till one day of the days as i according to my custom 
was sitting in my shop an old woman came up and gave me the good morning and greeted me with a salaam i returned her salute when she seated her upon the shop board and asked me saying o oh, master hast thou any pieces of choice indian stuffs i replied o oh, my mistress i have with me whatso thou wantest and she rejoined bring me forth one of them accordingly i arose and fetched her a hindi piece of the costliest price and placed it in her hands she took it and examining it was greatly pleased by its beauty and presently said to me o oh my lord for how much is this said i five hundred dinars whereupon she pulled forth her purse and counted out to me the five hundred gold pieces then she took the stuff and went her ways and i o oh our lord of the sultan had sold to her for five hundred sequins a piece of cloth worth at cost three hundred and fifty gold pieces she came to me again o oh my lord on the next day and asked me for another piece so i rose up and brought her the bundle and she paid me once more five hundred dinars then she took up her bargain and gained her gate she did the same o oh my lord on the third and the fourth day and so on to the fifteenth taking a piece of stuff from me and pay me regularly five hundred golden pieces for each bargain on the sixteenth behold she entered my shop as was her wont but she found not her purse so she said to me o quahaya i have left my purse at home said i o my lady and thou return tis well and if not thou art welcome to it she swore she would not take it and i on the other hand swear her to carry it off as a token of love and friendship thereupon debate fell between us and i o oh our lord the sultan had made much of money by her and had she taken two pieces gratis i would not have asked any questions and anent them at last she cried o oh kawaya i have sworn an oath and thou hast sworn an oath and we shall never agree except thou favour me by accompanying me to my house so thou mayest receive the value of the stuff when neither of us will have been forsworn therefore lock up thy shop lest anything be lost in thine absence accordingly i bolted my door and went with her o oh, our lord the sultan and we ceased not walking conversing the while we walked i and she until we neared her abode when she pulled out a kerchief from her girdle and said tis my desire to bind this over thine eyes quoth i for what cause and quoth she for that on our way be sundry houses whose doors are open and the women are sitting in the vestibules of their homes so that happily thy glance may alight upon some one of them married or maid and thy heart become engaged in a love affair and thou abide distraught because in this quarter of the town be many fair faces wives and virgins who would fascinate even a religious and therefore we are alarmed for thy peace of mind upon this i said in myself by allah this old woman is able of advice and i consented to her requirement when she bound the kerchief over my eyes and blindfolded me then we walked on till we came to the house she sought and when she rapped with the door ring a slave girl came out and opening the door let us in the old body then approached me and unbound the kerchief from over my eyes whereupon i looked around me holding myself to be a captive and i found me in a mansion having sundry separate apartments in the wings and was richly decorated resembling the palaces of the kings and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased saying her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Dunyazad, How sweet and tasteful is thy tale, O sister mine, and how enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, And where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? Now, when it was the next night, and that was, the three hundred and forty-ninth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me 
o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth pursued by allah o our lord the sultan of that house i never saw the fellow then she bade me hide within a room and i did her bidding in a corner place where beside me i beheld heaped together and cast down in that private sight all the pieces of stuff which the ancient dame had purchased of me seeing this i marvelled in my mind and lo appeared two damsels as they were moons and came down from an upper story till they stood on the ground floor after which they cut a piece of cloth into twain and each maiden took one and tucked up her sleeves then they sprinkled the court of that palace with water of the rose and of the orange flower wiping the surface with the cloth and rubbing it till it became as silver after which the two girls retired into an inner room and brought out some fifty chairs which they sat down and placed over each seat a rug with cushions of brocade they then carried in a larger chair of gold and placed upon it a carpet with cushions of orfraid work and after a time they withdrew presently there descended from the staircase two following two a host of maidens in number till they evened the chairs and each one of them sat down upon her own and at last suddenly appeared a young lady in whose service were ten damsels and she walked up to and they seated her upon the great chair when i beheld her o my lord the sultan my right senses left me and my wits fled me and i was astounded at her loveliness and her stature and her symmetric grace as she swayed to and fro in her pride of beauty and gladsome spirits amongst those damsels and laughed and sported with them at last she cried aloud o mother mine when the ancient dame answered her call and she asked her hast thou brought the young man the old woman replied yes he is present between thy hands and the fair lady said bring him hither to me but when i heard these words i said to myself there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great doubtless when this damsel shall have discovered my being in such hiding place she will bid them to do me die the old woman then came forwards to me and led me before the young lady seated on the great chair and when i stood in her presence she smiled in my face and saluted me with a salaam and welcomed me after which she signed for a seat to be brought and when her bidding was obeyed set it close beside her own she then commanded me to sit and i seated me by her side and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fiftieth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth pursued she seated me beside her o our lord the sultan and fell to talking and joking with me for an hour or so when she said o youth what sayest thou of me and of my beauty and my loveliness would heaven that i could occupy thy thought and please thee so that i might become to thee wife and thou to be me man when i heard these words i replied o my lady how dare i presume to attain such honour indeed i do not deem myself worthy to become a slave between thy hands hereupon said she nay o young man my words have in them nor evasion nor alteration so be not disheartened or fearful of returning me a reply for that my heart is fulfilled of thy love i now understood o our lord the sultan 
that the damsel was desirous of marrying me but i could not conceive what was the cause thereof or who could have given her intelligence concerning me she continued to enjoy herself in the gladsomest way till at length i was emboldened to say to her o my lady and thy words to me be after the fashion of thy will remember the proverb when a kindness is to be done this is its time by allah o youth there cannot be a more fortunate day than this present o my lady what shall i apportion to thee for dowry the dowry hath been paid to me in the value of the stuffs which thou entrustest to this ancient dame who is my mother that cannot suffice by allah naught shall be added but o youth tis my intention forthright to send after the kazi and his assessors and i will choose me a trustee that they may tie together us twain without delay and thou shalt come in to me this coming evening but all such things be upon one condition and what may be that condition this that thou swear never to address or to draw near any woman save myself and i o our lord sultan being unmarried and eager to possess so beautiful a bride said to her this be thine and i will never contrary thee by word or by deed she then sent to summon the kazi and his witnesses and appointed an agent upon which they knotted the knot after the marriage ceremony was ended she ordered coffee and sherbets and gave somewhat of dirhams to the kazi and a robe of honour to her trustee and this done all went their several ways i was lost in astonishment and said in my mind do i dream or am i on wake she then commanded her damsels to clear the hammam bath and cleanse it and fill it afresh and get ready towels and waist cloths and silken napkins and scented woods and essences as virgin ambergris and otters and perfumes of varied coloured hues and kinds and when they had executed her orders she ordered the eunuchry standing in her service to take me and bear me to the bath largessing each one with a sumptuous dress they led me into a haman which had been made private and i saw a place tongue is powerless to portray and as we arrived there they spread very coloured carpets upon which i sat me down and doffed what clothing was upon me then i entered the hot rooms and smelt delicious scents diffused from the sides of the hall sandalwood comorin lignaloes and other such fragrant substances here they came up to me and seated me leathering me with perfumed soaps and shampooed me till my body became silver bright when they fetched the metal tassus and i washed with water lukewarm after which they brought me cold water mingled with rose water and i sprinkled it over me after this they supplied me with silken napkins and drying towels of palm fibre wherewith i rubbed me and then repaired to the cool room outside the caladarium where i found a royal dress the unitry arrayed me therein and after fumigating me with the smoke of lignaloes served up somewhat of confections and coffee and sherbets of sundry sorts so i drank after eating the majun about eventide i left the baths with all the eunuchry in attendance on me and we walked till we entered the palace and they led me into a closet spread with kingly carpets and cushions and behold she came up to me attired in a new habit more sumptuous than that i had seen her wearing erewhile and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-first night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding 
lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth continued and i o our lord the sultan went into the closet and behold she met me wearing a habit of the most sumptuous so when i sighted her she seemed to me from the richness of her ornaments like an enchanted hoard wherefrom the talisman had been newly removed she sat down beside me and bent lovingly over me and i rose up for i could no longer contain my passion and wrought that work which was to be worked presently she again disappeared but soon returned in vestments even richer than the last and she did with me as before and i embraced her once more in short o oh, our lord the sultan we ceased not dwelling together i and she in joyance and enjoyment laughter and disport and delicious converse for a space of twenty days at the end of this time i called to mind my lady mother and said to the dame i had espoused o oh, my lady tis long since i have been absent from home and tis long since my parent hath seen me or would a thought concerning me needs must she be pining and grieving for my sake so do thou give me leave to visit her and look after my mother and also after my shop quoth she no harm in that thou mayst visit thy mother daily and busy thyself about thy shop business but this ancient dame my mother is she who must lead thee out and bring thee back whereto i replied tis well upon this the old woman came in and tied a kerchief over my eyes according to custom and fared forth with me till we reached the spot where she had been wont to remove the bandage here she unbound it saying we will expect thee to-morrow about noontide and when thou comest to this place thou shalt see me awaiting thee i left her and repaired to my mother whom i found grieving and weeping at my absence and upon seeing me she rose up and threw arms around my neck with tears of joy i said weep not o my mother for the cause of my absence hath been a certain matter which be thus and thus i then related to her my adventure and she on hearing it was rejoiced thereby and exclaimed o my son may allah give thee gladness but i pray thee solace me at least every two days with a visit that my longing for thee may be satisfied i replied this shall be done and thenceforth o our lord the sultan i went to my shop and busied myself as was my wont till noontide when i returned to the place appointed and found the old woman awaiting me nor did i ever fare forth from the mansion without her binding my eyes with the kerchief which she loosened only when we reached my own house and whenever i asked her of this she would answer on our way be sundry houses whose doors are open and the women sitting in the vestibules of their homes so that haply thy glance may alight upon some one of them matron or maid all sniff up love like water and we fear for thee lest thy heart be netted in the net of amours for thirty days a whole month i continued to go and come after this fashion but o oh, our lord the sultan at all times and tides i was drowned in thought and wondered in my mind saying what chance caused me forgether with this damsel what made me marry her whence this wealth which is under her hand how came i to win union with her for i knew not the cause of all this now on a day of the days i found an opportunity of being private with one of her black slave girls and questioned her of all these matters that concerned her mistress she replied o my lord the history of my lady is marvellous but i dare not relate it to thee in fear lest she hear thereof and do me die so i said to her by allah o handmaid of good and wilt thou say me sooth i will veil it darkly for in the keeping of secrets there is none like myself nor will i reveal it at any time then i took oath of secrecy when she said o my lord and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine 
and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-second night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth continued then the handmaiden said to me o my lord my lady went forth one day of the days to the hammam with the object of pleasuring and of diverting herself for which purpose she made goodly preparation including gifts and presents matters worth a mend of money after leaving the baths she set out upon an excursion to eat the noonday meal in a flower garden where she enjoyed herself with exceeding joy and enjoyment eating and drinking till the evening and when she designed to depart she collected the fragments of the feast and distributed them amongst the mean and the mesquin on her return she passed through the bazaar street wherein standeth thy shop and it was a friday when thou wast sitting adorned with thy finest dress in converse with the nearest neighbour and suddenly as she fared by she beheld thee in such a state and her heart was stricken with sore stroke of love albeit none of us observed her condition and what affection she had conceived for thee however no sooner had she reached her palace than her melancholy began to grow upon her with groans of her cark and care and her colour left her she ate and drank little and less and her sleep forsook her and her frame was sorely enfeebled till at last she took to her bed upon this her mother went to summon a learned man or a mediciner that he might consider the condition of her daughter and what sickness had gotten about her she was absent for an hour and returned with an ancient dame who took seat beside her and putting forth her hand felt the patient's pulse but she could perceive in her no bodily ailment or pain upon which the old woman understood her case but she durst not bespeak her of it nor mention to her mother that the girl's heart was distraught by love so she said there is no harm to thee and ishallah to-morrow i will return hither to thee and bring with me a certain medicine she then went forth from us and leading the mother to a place apart said to her o my lady allah upon thee pardon me for whatso i shall mention and be thou convinced that my words are true and keep them secret nor divulge them to any the other replied say on and fear not for aught which hath become manifest to thee of my daughter's unweal happily allah will vouchsafe welfare she rejoined verily thy daughter hath no bodily disorder or malady of the disease kind but she is in love and there can be no cure for her save union with her beloved quoth the mother and how about the coming of her sweetheart this is a matter which may not be managed except thou show us some contrivance whereby to bring this youth hither and marry him to her but contrivance is with allah then the old lady went her ways forthright and the girl's mother sought her daughter and said to her after kindly fashion o my child as for thee thy disorder is a secret and not a bodily disease tell me of him thou requirest and fear not for me be like allah will open to us the gate of contrivance whereby thou shalt win to thy wish now when the maiden heard these words she was abashed before her parent and kept silence being ashamed to speak nor would she return any reply for the space of twenty days but during this term her distraction increased and her mother ceased not to repeat the same words time after time till it became manifest to the parent that the daughter was madly in love with the young man so at last quoth she describe him to me quoth the other o mother mine indeed he is young of years and fair of favour also he wanneth in such a bazaar 
methinks on its southern side therewith the dame arose without stay or delay and fared forth to find the young man and tis thyself o youth and when the mother saw thee she took from thee a piece of cloth and brought it to her daughter and promised thou shouldst visit her thenceforwards she ceased not repeating her calls to thee for the period thou wouldest well until by her cunning she brought thee hither and that happened which happened and thou didst take the daughter to wife such is her tale and beware lest thou reveal my disclosure no by allah i replied then the lunatic resumed speaking to the sultan o oh my lord i continued to cohabit with her for the space of one month going daily to see my mother and to sell in my shop and i returned to my wife every evening blindfolded and guided as usual by my mother-in-law now one day of the days as i was sitting at my business a damsel came into the bazaar street and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-third night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth continued a damsel came into the bazaar street bearing the image of a cock made of precious ore and crusted with pearls and rubies and other gems and she offered it to the good men of the market for sale so they opened the biddings at five hundred dinars and they ceased not contending thereanent till the price went up to nine hundred and fifty gold pieces all this time and i looked on nor did i interfere by speaking a syllable or by adding to the biddings a single bit of gold at last when none would offer aught more the girl came up to me and said o oh my lord all the gentlemen have increased their biddings for the cock but thou hast neither bidden nor heartened my heart by one kind word quoth i i have no need thereof and quoth she by allah needs must thou bid somewhat more than the others i replied since there is no help for it i will add fifty dinars which will fill up the thousand she rejoined allah gar thee gain so i fared into my shop to fetch the money saying in my mind i will present this curiosity to my harem haply twill pleasure her but when i was about o my lord the sultan to count out the thousand ducats the damsel would not accept aught of me but said i have a request to make of thee o youth to wit that i may take one kiss from thy cheek i asked her for what purpose and she answered i want one kiss of thy cheek which shall be the price of my cock for i need of thee naught else i thought to myself by allah a single kiss of my cheek for the value of a thousand sequins were an easy price and i gave my consent thereto o my lord then she came up to me and leaned over me and bust my cheek but after the kiss she bit me with a bite which left its mark then she gave me the cock and went her ways in haste now when it was noon i made for my wife's house and came upon the old woman awaiting me at the custom stead and she bound the kerchief over my eyes and after blindfolding them fared with me till we reached our home when she unbound it i found my wife sitting in the saloon dressed from head to foot in cramoisi and with an ireful face whereupon i said to myself o oh, saviour save me i then went up to her and took out the cock which was covered with pearls and rubies thinking that her evil humour would vanish at the sight of it and said o oh, my lady accept this cock for tis curious and admirable to look upon and i bought it to pleasure thee 
she put forth her hand and taking it from me examined it by turning it rightwards and leftwards then exclaimed didst thou in very sooth buy this on my account replied i by allah o my lady i bought it for thee at a thousand gold pieces hereupon she shook her head at me o my lord the sultan and cried out after a long look at my face what meaneth that bite on thy cheek then with a loud and angry voice she called to her women who came down the stairs forthright bearing the body of a young girl with the head cut off and set upon the middle of the corpse and i looked and behold it was the head of the damsel who had sold me the cock for a kiss and who had bitten my cheek now my wife had sent her with the toy by way of trick saying to her let us try this youth whom i have wedded and see if he hold himself bound by his plighted word and pact or if he be false and foul but all of this i knew not then she cried a second cry and behold up came three maids bearing with them three cocks like that which i had brought for her and she said thou bringest me this one cock when i have these three cocks but inasmuch as o youth thou hast broken the covenant that was between me and thee i want thee no more go forth wend thy ways forthright and she raged at me and cried to her mother take him away and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-fourth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth continued to the king hereupon the old woman o my lord had me by the hand and bound the kerchief over my eyes as was her wont and led me to the accustomed place where she loosened the bandage saying be gone and disappeared but i o oh my lord became like a madman and ran through the streets as one frantic crying ah her loveliness ah her stature ah her perfect grace ah her ornaments hereupon the folk seeing me and hearing me say these words shouted out yonder is a lunatic so they seized me perforce and jailed me in the madhouse as thou hast seen me o our lord the sultan they say this mad is jinn mad but by allah i am no maniac o my lord and such is my tale hereat the king marvelled and bowed his brow groundwards for a while in deep thought over this affair then he raised his head and turning to his minister said o wazir by the truth of him who made me ruler of this realm except thou discover the damsel who married this youth thy head shall pay forfeit the wazir was concerned to hear the case of the young man but he could not disobey the royal commandment so he said allow me three days of delay o lord the sultan and to this much of grace the king consented then the wazir craved dismissal and would have taken the youth with him when the sultan cried as soon as thou shalt half hit upon the house the young man will go into it and come forth it like other folk he replied hearkening and obedience so he took the youth and went out with aching head and giddy as a drunken man perplexed and unknowing whither he should wend and he threaded the city streets from right to left and from east to west tarrying at times that he might privily question the folk but not discovered itself to him and he made certain of death in this condition he continued for two days and the third till noontide when he devised him a device and said to the youth knowest thou the spot where the old woman was wont to blindfold thine eyes he replied yes 
so the minister walked on with him till the young man exclaimed here tis this the wazir then said o youth knowest thou door ring whereth she was wont to rap and canst thou distinguish its sound he said i can accordingly the wazir took him and went the round of all the houses in that quarter and rapped with every door ring asking him is this and he would answer no and the twain ceased not to do after such fashion until they came to the door where the appointment had taken place without risk threatened and the wazir knocked hard at it and the youth hearing the knock exclaimed o my lord verily this be the ring without question or doubt or uncertainty so the minister knocked again with the same knocker and the slave girls threw open the door and the wazir entering with the youth found that the palace belonged to the daughter of the sultan who had been succeeded by his liege lord but when the princess saw the minister together with her spouse she adorned herself and came down from the harem and salaamed to him thereupon he asked her what hath been thy business with this young man so she told him her tale from the first to last and he said o my lady the king commandeth that he enter and quit the premises as before and that he come hither without his eyes being banished with the kerchief she obeyed and said the commandments of our lord the sultan shall be carried out such was the history of that youth whom the sultan heard reading the koran in the maristan the public madhouse but as regards the second lunatic who sat listening the sultan asked him and thou the other what be thy tale so he began to relate the story of the second lunatic section six story of the second lunatic o oh, my lord quoth the young man my case is marvellous and happily thou wilt desire me to relate it in order continuous and quoth the sultan let me hear it and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-fifth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the second youth said o my lord the sultan i am by calling a merchant man and none of the guild was younger i having just entered my sixteenth year like my fellows i sold and bought in the bazaar every day till one of the days a damsel came up to me and drew near and handed to me a paper which i opened and behold it was full of verses and odes in praise of myself and in the end of the letter contained the woman's name professing to be enamoured of me when i read it i came down from my shop board in my folly and ignorance and putting forth my hand seized the girl and beat her till she swooned away after this i let her loose and she went her ways and then i fell into a brown study saying to myself would heaven i wot whether the girl be without relations or if she have kith and kin to whom she may complain and they will come and bastinado me and o oh, our lord the sultan i repented of what i had done when as repentance availed me not and this lasted me for twenty days at the end of that time as i was sitting in my shop according to my custom behold a young lady entered and she was sumptuously clad and sweetly scented and she was even as the moon in its fullness on the fourteenth night when i gazed upon her my wits fled and my senses and right judgment forsook me and i was incapable of attending to aught save herself then she came up and said o youth 
hast thou by thee a variety of metal ornaments and said i o my lady of all kinds thou canst possibly require hereupon she wished to see some anklets which i brought out for her when she put forth her feet to me and showing me the calves of her legs said o my lord try them on me this i did then she asked for a necklace and i produced one when she unveiled her bosom and said take its measure on me so i set it upon her and she said i want a fine pair of bracelets and i brought to her a pair when extending her hands and displaying her wrist to me she said put them on me i did so and presently she asked me what may be the price of all these when i exclaimed o oh, my lady accept them from me in free gift and this was of the excess of my love to her o king of the age and my being wholly absorbed in her then i quoth to her o my lady whose daughter art thou and quoth she i am the daughter of the sheikh al-islam i replied my wish is to ask thee in marriage of thy father and she rejoined tis well but o youth i would have thee know that when thou ask me from my sire he will say i have but one daughter and she is a cripple and deformed even as sada was do thou however make answer that thou art contented to accept her and if he offer any remonstrance cry i am content content then i inquired when shall that be and she replied to-morrow about under an hour come to our house and thou wilt find my sire the sheikh al-islam sitting with his companions and intimates then ask me to wife so we agreed upon this counsel and on the next day o our lord the sultan i went with several of my comrades and we repaired i and they to the house of the sheikh al-islam whom i found sitting with sundry grandees about him we made our salaams which they returned and they welcomed us and all entered into friendly and familiar conversation when it was time for the noon meal the tablecloth was spread and they invited us to join them so we dined with them and after dinner drank coffee i then stood up saying o my lord i come hither to sue and solicit thee for the lady concealed and the pearl unrevealed thy daughter but when the sheikh al-islam heard from me these words he bowed his head for a while groundwards and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-sixth night Danyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth resumed now when the sheikh al-islam heard from me those words he bowed his brow groundwards for a while in deep thought concerning the case of his daughter who was a cripple and wondrously deformed for the damsel who had told me of her had played a trick and served me a slight i all the time knowing nothing about her guile presently he raised his head and said to me by allah o my son i have a daughter but she is helpless quoth i i am content and quoth he and thou take her to wife after this description tis on express condition that she not be removed from my house and thou also shalt pay her the first visit and cohabit with her in my home i replied to hear is to obey being confident o king of the age that she was the damsel who had visited my shop and whom i had seen with my own eyes thereupon the sheikh al-islam married his daughter to me and i said in my mind by allah is it possible that i am become master of this damsel and shall enjoy to my full her beauty and loveliness 
but when night fell they led me in procession to the chamber of my bride and when i beheld her i found her as hideous as her father had described her a deformed cripple at that moment all manner of cares mounted my back and i was full of fury and groaned with grief from the core of my heart but i could not say a word for that i had accepted her to wife of my own free will and had declared myself contented in presence of her sire so i took seat silently in a corner of the room and my bride in another because i could not bring myself to approach her she being unfit for the carnal company of man and my soul could not accept cohabitation with her and at dawn tide o my lord of the sultan i left the house and went to my shop which i opened according to custom and sat down with my head dizzy like one drunken without wine when lo there appeared before me the young lady who had caused happen to me that mishap she came up and shalom to me but i rose with sullenness and abused her and cried wherefore o my lady hast thou put upon me such a piece of work she replied o miserable recollect such a day when i brought thee a letter and thou after reading it didst come down from thy shop and didst seize me and didst trounce me and didst drive me away i replied o my lady prithee pardon me for i am a true penitent and i ceased not to soften her with soothing words and promised her all weal if she would but forgive me at last she deigned excuse me and said there is no harm for thee and as i have netted thee so will i unmesh thee i replied allah allah o my lady i am under thy safeguard and she rejoined hie thee to the aga of the janakila the gypsies give him fifty piastres and say him we desire thee to furnish us with a father and a mother and cousins and kith and kin and do thou charge them to say of me this is our cousin and our blood relation then let him send them all to the house of the sheikh al-islam and repair thither himself together with his followers a party of drummers and a parcel of pipers when they enter his house and the sheikh shall perceive them and exclaim what's this we've here let the aga reply o my lord we be kinsmen with thy son-in-law and we are come to gladden his marriage with thy daughter and to make merry with him he will exclaim is this thy son a gypsy musician and do thou explain saying i verily i am a john Kali. and he will cry out to thee o dog thou art a gypsy and yet durst thou marry the daughter of the sheikh al-islam then do thou make answer o my lord twas my ambition to be ennobled in thine alliance and i have espoused thy daughter only that the mean name of jacali may pass away from me and that i may be under the skirt of thy protection hereat o my lord the sultan i arose without stay and delay and did as the damsel bade me and agreed with the chiefs of the gypsies for fifty piastres on the second day about noon lo and behold all ajan akila met before the house of the sheikh al-islam and they a tom-tomming and a piping and a dancing crowded into the courtyard of the mansion and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-seventh night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth continued so the john Akila entered the house of the sheikh al-islam all a drumming and a dancing 
presently the family came out and asked what is to do and what be this hubbub the fellows answered we are gypsy folk and our son is in your house having wedded the daughter of the sheikh al-islam hearing these words the family went up and reported to its head and he rising from his seat descended to the courtyard which he found full of john Callies. he inquired of them their need and they told him that the youth their kinsman having married the daughter of the house they were come to make merry at the bride feast quoth the sheikh this indeed be a sore calamity that a gypsy should espouse the daughter of the sheikh al-islam by allah i will divorce her from him so he sent after me o our lord the sultan and asked me saying what is thy breed and what wilt thou take to be off with thyself said i a jancali and i married thy daughter with one design namely to sink the mean name of a gypsy drummer in the honour of connection and relationship with thee he replied tis impossible that my daughter can cohabit with thee so up and divorce her i rejoined not so i will never repudiate her then we fell to quarrelling but the folk interposed between us and arranged that i should receive forty purses for putting her away and when he paid me the monies i gave her the divorce and took the coin and went to my shop rejoicing at having escaped by this contrivance on the next day behold came the damsel who had taught me the slight and saluted me and wished me good morning i returned her salaam and indeed o our lord the sultan she was a model of beauty and loveliness stature and symmetrical grace and my heart was enmeshed in her love for the excess of her charms and limpid flow of her speech and the sweetness of her tongue so i said to her and when this promise and said she i am the daughter of such and such a cook in such a quarter and do thou go ask me in marriage of him so i rose up with all haste and went to her father and prayed that he would give her to me and presently i wedded her and went in unto her and found her as the full moon of the fourteenth night and was subjugated by her simliad such then is the adventure which befell me but o my lord the sultan the story of the sage such an one and his scholar is more wonderful and delectable for indeed tis of the marvels of the age and among the miracles which have been seen by man thereupon the sovereign bade him speak and the second lunatic proceeded to recount the story of the sage and the scholar section seven story of the sage and the scholar there was in times of yore and in ages long gone before a learned man who had retired from the world secluding himself in an upper cell of a cathedral mosque and this place he left not for many days save upon the most pressing needs at last a beautiful boy whose charms were unrivalled in his time went in to him and salaamed to him the sheikh returned the salute and welcomed him with the fairest welcome and courteously entreated him seating him beside himself then he asked him of his case and whence he came and the boy answered o my lord question me not of aught nor of my worldly matters for verily i am as one who hath fallen from the heavens upon the earth and my sole object is the honour of tending thee the sage again welcomed him and the boy served him assiduously for a length of time till he was twelve years old now on one day of the days the lad heard certain of his fellows saying that the sultan had a daughter endowed with beauty whose charms were unequalled by all the princesses of the age so he fell in love with her by hearsay and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-eighth night danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy 
finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the lad who served the sage fell in love with the sultan's daughter by hearsay presently he went in to his master and told him thereof adding o my lord verily the king hath a daughter beautiful and lovesome and my soul longeth to look upon her and it be only a single look the sheikh asked him saying wherefore o my son what have the like of us to do with the daughters of sovereigns or others we be an order of eremites and self-contained and we fear the kings for our own safety and the sage continued to warn the lad against the shifts of time and to divert him from his intent but the more words he uttered to warn him and to deter him the more resolved he became to win his wish so that he abode continually groaning and weeping now this was a grievous matter to the good sheikh who loved him with an exceeding love passing all bounds when he saw him in this condition he exclaimed there is no majesty and there is no might save allah the glorious the great and his heart was softened and he had ruth upon the case of his scholar and pitied his condition and at last said to him my son dost thou truly long to look but a single look at the sultan's daughter quoth he yes o my lord and quoth the other come hither to me accordingly he came up to him and the sheikh produced a coal pot and applied the powder to one of his scholar's eyes who behold forthright became such that all who saw him cried out this is half a man then the sage bade him go about the city and the youth obeyed his commands and fared forth but when as the folk espied him they cried out a miracle a miracle this be a half man and the more the youth walked about the streets the more the folk followed him and gazed upon him for diversion and marvelled at the spectacle and as often as the great men of the city heard him they sent to summon him and solaced themselves with the sight and said loud unto the lord allah createth whatso he wisheth and commandeth whatso he willeth as we see in the fashion of this half man the youth also looked freely upon the harems of the grandees he being fairer than any of them and this case continued till the report reached the sultan who bade him be brought into the presence and on seeing him marvelled at the works of the almighty presently the whole court gathered together to gaze at him in wonderment and the tidings soon reached the queen who sent a eunuch to fetch him and introduce him into the seraglio the women all admired the prodigy and the princess looked at him and he looked at her so his fascination increased upon him and he said in his secret soul and i wed her not i will slay myself after this the youth was dismissed by the sultan's harem and he whose heart burned with love for the king's daughter returned home the sheikh asked him hast thou o my son seen the princess and he answered i have o my master but this one look sufficeth me not nor can i rest until i sit by her side and fill myself with gazing upon her quoth he o my child we be an aesthetic folk that shun the world nor have we aught to do with enmeshing ourselves in the affairs of the sultan and we fear for thee o my son but the youth replied o my lord except i sit by her side and stroke her neck and shoulders with these hands i will slay myself hereupon the sage said in his mind i will do whatso i can for this good youth and perchance allah may enable him to win his wish he then arose and brought out the coal-pot and applied the powder to his scholar's either eye and when it had settled therein it made him invisible to the ken of man then he said go forth my son and indulge thy desire but return again soon and be not absent too long accordingly the youth hastened to the palace and entering it looked right and left none seeing him the while and proceeded to the harem where he seated himself beside the daughter of the sultan still none perceived him until after a time 
he put forth his hand and softly stroked her neck but as soon as the princess felt the youth's touch she shrieked a loud shriek heard by all the ears in the palace and cried i seek refuge with allah from satan the stoned at this proceeding on the girl's part all asked her saying what is to do with thee whereto she answered verily some satan hath this instant touched me on the neck upon this her mother was alarmed for her and sent for her nurse and when informed of what had befallen the girl the old woman said if there be aught of satan's here not is so sovereign as specific to drive them away and keep them off as the smoke of a camel's dung then she arose and brought thereof a quantity which was thrown into the fire and presently it scented and pervaded the whole apartment all this and the youth still sat there without being seen but when the dung smoke thickened his eyes brimmed and he could not but shed tears and the more smoke there was the more his eyes watered and big drops flowed till at last all the coal was washed off and trickled down with the tears so he became visible amidmost the royal harem and when the dames descried him all shrieked one shriek each at other upon which the unchery rushed in then finding the young man still seated there they laid hands upon him and hauled him before the sultan to whom they reported his crime and how he had been caught lurking in the king's seraglio sitting beside the princess hearing this the sovereign bade summon the headsman and committed to him the criminal bidding him take the youth and robe him in a black habit be patched with flame colour then to set him upon a camel and after parading him through cairo city and all the streets put him to death accordingly the executioner took the youth and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and fifty-ninth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the linkman took the youth and fared forth with him from the palace then he looked at him and found him fair of form and favor a sans peer in loveliness and he observed that he showed no fear nor shrinking from death so he had pity upon him and his heart yearned to him and he said in his mind by allah attached to this young man is a rare history then he brought a leathern gown which he put upon him and the flamy black habit which he passed over his arms and setting him upon a camel as the sultan had commanded at last carried him in procession crying out the while this is the award and the least award of him who violateth the harem of the king and he threaded the streets till they came to the square before the great mosque wherein was the sheikh now as all the folk were enjoying the spectacle the sage looked out from the window of his cell and beheld the condition of his scholar he was moved to ruth and reciting a spell he summoned the jann and bade them snatch the young man off the camel's back with all care and kindness and bring him to his cell and he also commanded an aun of the aunts to seize some oldster and set him upon the beast in lieu of the youth they did as he bid them for that he had taken fealty of the jann and because of his profound studies in the notarican and every branch of the art magical and when all the crowd saw the youth suddenly transformed into a grey beard they were awe-stricken and cried alhamdulillah laud to the lord the young man hath become an old man they then looked again and behold they saw a person well known amongst the lieges one who had long been wont to sell greens and colocasia at the hostelry gate near the cathedral mosque 
now the headsman noting this case was confounded with sore affright so he returned to the palace with the oldster seated on the camel and went into the sultan followed by all the city folk who were gazing at the spectacle when he stood before the king and the eunuchry and did homage and prayed for the sovereign and said o our lord the sultan verily the youth hath vanished and in lieu of him is this sheikh well known to the whole city hearing these words the king was startled sore fear entered his heart and he said to himself whatso hath been able to do this deed can do e'en more he can depose me from my kingship or he can devise my death so his affright increased and he was at a loss how to contrive for such case presently he summoned his minister and when he came into the presence said to him o wazir advise me how to act in the affair of this youth and what measures should be taken the minister bowed his brow groundwards in thought for a while then raising it he addressed the sultan and said o king of the age this be a thing beyond experience and the doer must be master of a might we comprehend not and haply he may work thee in the future some injury and we fear from him for thy daughter wherefore the right way is that thou issue a royal autograph and bid the crier go round about the city and cry saying let him who hath wrought this work appear before the king under promise of safety and again safety safety on the word of a sultan which shall never be falsed should the youth then surrender himself o king of the age marry him to thy daughter when perhaps his mind may be reconciled to thee by love of her he hath already cast eyes upon her and he hath seen the inmates of thy harem unrobed so that naught can save their honour but his being united with the princess hereupon the sultan indicted an autographic rescript and placed it in the crier's hands even as the wazir had counselled and the man went about the streets proclaiming by command of the just king whoso hath done this deed let him discover himself and come to the palace under promise of safety and again safety the safety of sovereigns safety on the word of a sultan which shall never be falsed and the crier ceased not crying till in fine he reached the square fronting the great mosque the youth who was standing there heard the proclamation and returning to his sheikh said o my lord the crier hath a rescript from the sultan and he crieth saying whoso hath done this deed let him discover himself and come to the palace under promise of safety and again safety safety on the word of a sultan which shall never be falsed and i must go to him perforce said the sage o my son why shouldst thou do on such wise hast thou not already suffered thy sufficiency but the young man exclaimed nothing shall prevent my going and at this the sheikh replied go then o my son and be thy safeguarding with the living the eternal accordingly the youth repaired to the hammam and having bathed attired himself in the richest attire he owned after which he went forth and discovered himself to the crier who led him to the palace and set him before the sovereign he salaamed to the sultan and did him obeisance and prayed for his long life and prosperity in style the most eloquent and proffered his petition in verse the most fluent the sultan looked at him and he habited in his best with all of beauty blessed and the royal mind was pleased and he inquired saying who art thou o youth the other replied i am the half-man whom thou sawest and i did the deed whereof thou wouldest as soon as the king heard this speech he entreated him with respect and bade him sit in the most honourable stead and when he was seated the twain conversed together the sultan was astounded at his speech and they continued their discourse till they touched upon sundry disputed questions of learning when the youth proved himself as superior to the sovereign as a dinar is to a dirham and to whatever niceties of knowledge the monarch asked the young man returned an all-sufficient answer speaking like a book so the sultan abode confounded at the eloquence of his tongue and the purity of his phrase and the readiness of his replies and he said in his mind 
this youth is as worthy to become my daughter's mate as she is to become his helpmate then he addressed him in these words o youth my wish is to unite thee with my daughter and after thou hast looked upon her and her mother none will marry her save thyself the other replied o king of the age i am ready to obey thee but first i must take counsel of my friends the king rejoined no harm in that hide thee home and ask their advice the youth then craved leave to retire and repairing to his sheikh and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixtieth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youth then craved leave to retire and repairing to his sheikh informed him of what had passed between himself and the sultan and said to him tis also my wish o my lord to marry his daughter the sage replied there be no fault herein if it be a lawful wedlock fare thee forth and ask her in marriage quoth the youth but i o my lord desire to invite the king to visit us and quoth the sage go invite him o my son and hearten thy heart the youth replied o my lord since i first came to thee and thou didst honour me by taking me into thy service i have known no other home save this narrow cell wherein thou sittest never stirring from it by night or by day how can we invite the king hither the sage rejoined o my son do thou go invite him relying upon allah the veiler who veileth all things and say to him my sheikh greeteth thee with the salaam and inviteth thee to visit him next friday accordingly the youth repaired to the king and saluted him and offered his service and blessed him with most eloquent tongue and said o king of the age my sheikh greeteth thee and saith to thee come eat thy porridge with us next friday whereto the sultan replied hearing is consenting then the youth returned to the sage and waited upon him according to custom longing the while for the coming of friday on that day the sage said to the youth o my son arise with me and i will show thee what house be ours so thou mayst go fetch the king then he took him and the two walked on till they came upon a ruin in the centre of the city and the whole was in heaps mud clay and stones the sage looked at it and said o my son this is our mansion do thou hie thee to the king and bring him hither but the youth exclaimed o my lord verily this be a ruinous heap how then can i invite the sultan and bring him to such an ill place this were a shame and a disgrace to us quoth the sage go and dread thou not upon this the youth departed saying in himself by allah my sheikh must be gin mad and doubtless he confoundeth in his insanity truth and untruth but he stinted not far until he reached the palace and went in to the sultan whom he found expecting him so he delivered the message deen honour us o my lord with thy presence hereupon the king arose without stay or delay and took horse and all the lords of the land also mounted following the youth to the place where he told them his sheikh abode but when they drew near it they found a royal mansion and unchery standing at the gates in costliest gear as if robed from a talismanic hoard when the young man saw this change of scene he was awestruck and confounded in such a way that hardly could he keep his senses and he said to himself 
but an instant ago i beheld with mine own eyes this very place a ruinous heap how then hath it suddenly become upon this same site a palace such as belongeth not to our sultan but i had better keep the secret to myself presently the king alighted as also did his suite and entered the mansion and when as he inspected it he marvelled at the splendour of the first apartment but the more narrowly he looked the more magnificent he found the place and the second more sumptuous than the first so his wits were bewildered thereat till he was ushered into a spacious speak-room where they found the sheikh sitting on one side of the chamber to receive them the sultan salaamed to him whereupon the sage raised his head and returned his greeting but did not rise to his feet the king then sat him down on the opposite side when the sheikh honoured him by addressing him and was pleased to converse with him on various themes all this while the royal senses being confounded at the grandeur around him and the rarities in that palace presently the sheikh said to his scholar knock thou at this door and bid our breakfast be brought in so the young man arose and rapped and called out bring in the breakfast when lo the door was opened and there came out of it an hundred mamelukes of the book each bearing upon his head a golden tray whereon were set dishes of precious metals and these which were filled with breakfast meats of all kinds and colours they ranged in order before the sultan he was surprised at the sight for that he had not so splendid in his own possession but he came forwards and ate as likewise did the sheikh and all the courtiers until they were satisfied and after this they drank coffee and sherbets and the sultan and the sheikh fell to conversing on questions of lore the king was edified by the words of the sage who on his part sat respectfully between the sovereign's hands now when it was well high noon the sheikh again said to his scholar knock thou on that door and bid our noonday meal be brought in he rose and rapped and called out bring in the dinner when lo the door opened of itself and there came out of it an hundred white slaves all other than the first train and each bearing a tray upon his head they spread the sufra cloth before the sultan and ranged the dishes and he looked at the plates and observed that they were of precious metals and stones whereat he was more astonished than before and he said to himself in very deed this be a miracle so all ate their sufficiency when basins and ewers some of gold and others of various noble ores were borne round and they washed their hands after which the sheikh said o king at how much hast thou valued for us the dower of thy daughter the sovereign replied my daughter's dower is already in my hands this he said of his courtesy and respect but the sheikh replied marriage is invalid save with a dower he then presented to him a mint of money and the tie of wedlock was duly tied after which he rose and brought for his guest a police of furs such as the sultan never had in his treasury and invested him therewith and he gave rich robes to each and every one of his courtiers according to their degree the sultan took leave of the sheikh and accompanied by the scholar returned to the palace and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixty-first night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan took with him the scholar and they fared till they reached the citadel and entered the palace during which time the king was pondering the matter and wondering at the affair 
and when night came he bade them get ready his daughter that the first visit might be paid to her by the bridegroom they did his bidding and carried the youth in procession to her and he found the apartment bespread with carpets and perfumed with essences the bride however was absent so he said in his mind she will come presently albeit now she delayeth and he ceased not expecting her till near midnight whilst the father and the mother said verily the young man hath married our daughter and now sleepeth with her on this wise the youth kept one reckoning and the sultan and his harem kept another till it was hard upon dawn all this and the bridegroom watched in expectation of the bride now when the day break the mother came to visit her child expecting to see her by the sight of her mate but she could not find a trace of her nor could she gather any clear tidings of her accordingly she asked the youth her son-in-law who answered that since entering the apartment he had expected his bride but she came not to him nor had he seen a sign of her hereupon the queen shrieked and rose up calling aloud upon her daughter for she had none other child save that one the clamour alarmed the sultan who asked what was to do and was informed that the princess was missing from the palace and had not been seen after she had entered it at eventide thereupon he went to the youth and asked him anent her but he also told him that he had not found her when the procession led him into the bridal chamber such was the case with these but as regards the princess when they conducted her to the bridal room before the coming of the bridegroom a jinni of the marids who often visited the royal harem happened to be there on the marriage night and was so captivated by the charms of the bride that he took a seat in a corner and upon her entering and before she was ware snatched her up and soared with her high in air and he flew with her till he reached a pleasant place of trees and rills some three months journey from the city and in that shady place he set her down but he wrought her no bodily damage and every day he would bring her whatso she wanted of meat and drink and solaced her by showing her the rills and trees now this jenny had changed his shape to that of a fair youth fearing lest his proper semblance affright her and the girl abode in that place for a space of forty days but the father after failing to find his daughter took the youth and repaired to the sheikh in his cell and he was as one driven mad as he entered and complained of the loss of his only child the sheikh hearing these words dove into the depths of meditation for an hour then he raised his head and bade them bring before him a chafing dish of lighted charcoal they fetched all he required and he cast into the fire some incenses over which he pronounced formulae of incantation and behold the world was turned topsy-turvy and the wind shrieked and the earth was canopied by dust clouds whence descended at speed winged troops bearing standards and colours and a middlemost of them appeared three sultans of jan all crying out at once labayaka labayak at sumas hither we speed to undertake thy need the sheikh then addressed them saying my commandment is that forthright ye bring me the jinni who hath snatched away the bride of my son and they said to hear is to obey and at once commanded fifty of their dependent jinns to reconduct the princess to her chamber and to hail the culprit before them these orders were obeyed they disappeared for an hour or so and suddenly returned bringing the delinquent jinni in person but as for the sultan's daughter ten of them conveyed her to her palace she wotting not of them and not feeling aught of fear and when they set the jinni before the sheikh he bade the three sultans of the jan burn him to death and so they did without stay or delay all this was done whilst the sovereign sat before the sheikh looking on and listening and marvelling at the obedience of that host and its sultans and their subjection and civil demeanour in the presence of the elder now as soon as the business ended after perfectest fashion the sage recited over them a spell and all went their several ways after which he bade the king take the youth and conduct him to his daughter 
this bidding was obeyed and presently the bridegroom abated the maidenhead of the bride what while her parents renewed their rejoicings over the recovery of their lost child and the youth was so enamoured of the princess that he quitted not the harem for seven consecutive days on the eighth the sultan was minded to make a marriage banquet and invited all the city folk to a feast for a whole month and he wrote a royal rescript and bade proclaim with full publicity that according to the commands of the king's majesty the wedding feast should continue for a month and that no citizen be he rich or be he poor should light fire or trim lamp in his own domicile during the wedding of the princess but that all must eat of the royal entertainment until the expiry of the fate so they slaughtered beeves and stabbed camels in the throat and the kitcheners and carpet spreaders were commanded to prepare the stables and the officers of the household were ordered to receive the guests by night and by day now one night king mohammed of cairo said to his minister o wazir do thou come with me and change costume and let us thread the streets and inspect and espy the folk happily some of the citizens have neglected to appear at the marriage feast he replied to hear is to obey so the twain after exchanging habits for the gear of persian darwishes went down to the city and there took place the night adventure of sultan mohammed of cairo section eight the night adventure of sultan mohammed of cairo the sultan and wazir threaded the broad ways of the city and they noted the houses and stood for an hour or so in each and every greater thoroughfare till they came to a lane a cul-de-sac where through none could pass and behold they hit upon a house containing a company of folk now these were conversing and saying by allah our sultan hath not acted wisely nor hath he any cause to be proud since he hath made his daughter's bride feast a vanity and a vexation and the poor are excluded therefrom he had done better to distribute somewhat of his bounty amongst the paupers in the mesquin who may not enter his palace nor can they obtain aught to eat hearing this the sultan said to the wazir by allah needs must we enter this place and the minister replied do whatso thou willest accordingly the king went up to the door and knocked when one came out and asked who is at the door the sultan answered guests and the voice rejoined welcome to the guests and the door was thrown open then they went in till they reached the sitting-room where they found three men of whom one was lame the second was broken-backed and the third was split-mouthed and all three were sitting together in that place so he asked them wherefore sit ye here ye three instead of going to the palace and they answered him o darwish tis the weakness of our wits the king then turned to his minister and said there is no help but thou must bring these three men into my presence as soon as the wedding feats be finished that i may inquire into what established their imbecility and Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixty-second night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan said to the wazir needs must thou bring these three men into my presence as soon as the wedding feats be finished and we will inquire into what proved their imbecility then quoth the king to them wherefore fare ye not ye three and eat of the royal banquet day by day and quoth they o darwish 
we are crippled folk who cannot go and come for this be grievous to us but an the sultan would assign to us somewhat of victual and send it hither we would willingly eat thereof he rejoined what knoweth the sultan that ye sit in this place and they retorted ye be darwishes who enter everywhere so when you go in to him tell him our tale haply shall the almighty allah incline his heart uswards the king asked them then be you three ever sitting together in this stead and they answered yea verily we never leave one another by night or by day then the king and the minister rose up and having presented them with a few silvers took leave and departed now it was midnight when they reached a tenement wherein sat three girls with their mother spinning and eating and each one appeared fairer than her fellows and at times they sang and then they laughed and then they talked the sultan said to the wazir there is no help but we enter to these damsels whereto the minister replied what have we to do with going near them let them be as they are the sultan however rejoined needs must we enter and the wazir retorted hearkening and obedience and he rapped at the door when one of the sisterhood cried out who knocketh in this gloom of the night the minister answered we are two darwishes guests and strangers and the girl rejoined we are maidens with our mother and we have no men in our house who can admit you so fare ye to the marriage feast of the sultan and become ye his guests the minister continued we are foreigners and we know not the way to the palace and we dread lest the chief of police happen upon us and apprehend us at this time of night we desire that you afford us lodging till daylight when we will go about our business and you need not expect from us aught save respect and honourable treatment now when the mother heard this she pitied them and bade one daughter open the door so the damsel threw it open and the sultan and wazir entered and salaamed and sat down to converse together but the king gazed upon the sisters and marvelled at their beauty and their loveliness and said in his mind how cometh it that these maidens dwell by themselves unmated and in such case so quoth he to them how is it ye lack husbands you being so beautiful and that ye have not a man in the house quoth the youngest o darwish hold thy tongue nor ask us of aught for our story is wondrous and our adventures marvellous but where thy words and shorten thy speech verily hadst thou been the sultan and thy companion the wazir and you heard our history haply ye had taken compassion upon our case thereupon the king turned to the minister and said up with us and we wend our ways but first do thou make sure of the place and affix thy mark upon the door then the twain rose up and fared forth but the wazir stood a while and set a sign upon the entrance and there left his imprint after which the twain returned to the palace presently the youngest sister said to her mother by allah i fear lest the darwishes have made their mark upon our door to the end that they may recognize it by day for haply the twain may be the king and his minister what proof hast thou of this asked the mother and the daughter answered their language and their questioning which were not save importunity and saying this she went to the door where she found the sign and mark now besides the two houses to the right and to the left were fifteen doors so the girl marked them all with the same mark set by the wazir but when allah had caused the day to dawn the king said to the minister go thou and look at the sign and make sure of it the wazir went as he was commanded by the sultan but he found all the doors marked in the same way whereat he marvelled and knew not nor could he distinguish the door he sought presently he returned and reported the matter of the door marks to the king who cried by allah these girls must have a curious history but when the bride feast is finished we will inquire into the case of the three men who are weak witlings and then we will consider that of the damsels who are not as soon as the thirtieth feast day passed by he invested with robes of honour all the lords of his land and the high officers of his estate and matters returned to their customed course 
then he set to summon the three men who had professed themselves weak of wits and they were brought into the presence each saying of himself what can the king require of us when they came before him he bade them be seated and they sat then he said to them my requirement is that ye relate to me proofs of the weakness of your minds and the reason of your maims now the first who was questioned was he of the broken back and when the inquiry was put to him he said deign favour me with an answer o our lord the sultan on a matter which passed through my mind he replied speak out and fear not so the other inquired how didst thou know us and who told thee of us and our weakly wits quoth the king twas the darwish who went into you on such a night and quoth the broken back man allah slay all the darwishes who be tailors and tail carriers thereupon the sultan turned to the wazir and laughing said we will not reproach them for aught rather let us make fun of them adding to the man recite o sheik so he fell to telling the story of the broke-back schoolmaster section nine the story of the broke-back schoolmaster i began life o king of the age as a schoolmaster and my case was wondrous and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased saying her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Dunyazad, How sweet and tasteful is thy tale, O sister mine, and enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, And where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? Now, when it was the next night, and that was the three hundred and sixty-third night. Danyazad said to her, Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy. Finish for us thy tale, that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night. She replied, With love and good will. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sheikh continued i began life o my lord as a schoolmaster and my tale with the boys was wondrous they numbered from sixty to seventy and i taught them to read and i inculcated due discipline and ready respect esteeming these a part of liberal education nor did i regard o king of the age the vicissitudes of time and change nay i held them with so tight a rein that whenever the boys heard me sneeze they were expected to lay down their writing tablets and stand up with their arms crossed and exclaim allah have ruth upon thee o our lord whereto i would make reply allah deign pardon us and you and if any of the lads failed or delayed to join in this prayer I was wont to bash him with a severe bashing. One day of the days they asked leave to visit the outskirts of the town for liberty and pleasuring, and when I granted it they clubbed their pittances for a certain sum of money to buy them a noonday meal. So we went forth to the suburbs, and there found verdure and water, and we enjoyed ourselves that day with perfect enjoyment until mid-afternoon, when we purposed to return homewards accordingly the boys collected their belongings and laded them upon an ass and we walked about halfway when behold the whole party big and little stood still and said to me o our lord we are athirst and burning with drowsiness nor can we stir from this spot and if we leave it without drinking we shall all die now there was in that place a draw well but it was deep and we had nor pitcher nor bucket nor aught wherein to draw water and the scholar still suffered from exceeding thirst we had with us however cooking gear such as cauldrons and platters so i said to them o boys whoso carrieth a cord or hath bound his belongings with one let him bring it hither they did my bidding and i tied these articles together and spliced them as strongly as i could then i said to the lads bind me under the armpits accordingly they made me fast by passing the rope around me and i took with me a cauldron 
whereupon they let me down bucket-wise into the well till I reached the water. Then I loosened the bandage from under my armpits, and tied it to the cauldron, which I filled brim full, and shook the rope for a signal to the boys above. They hauled at the vessel till they pulled it up, and began drinking and giving drink, and on this wise they drew a first cauldron, and a second, and a third, and a fourth till they were satisfied, and could no more, and cried out to me, We have had enough, quite enough. Hereupon I bound the bandage under my armpits, as it was when I went down, and I shook it as a signal, and they hauled me up till I had well nigh reached the curbstone of the well, when a fit of sneezing seized me, and I sneezed violently. At this all let go their hold, and carrying their arms over their breasts, cried aloud, Allah have ruth upon thee, O our Lord. But I, as soon as they loosened hold, fell into the depths of the well, and break my back. I shrieked for excess of agony, and all the boys ran on all sides, screaming for aid, till they were heard by some wayfaring folk, and these hailed at me and drew me out. They placed me upon the ass and bore me home. Then they brought a leech to medicine me, and at last I became even as thou seest me, O Sultan of the Age. Such then is my story, showing the weakness of my wits. For had I not enjoined and enforced over respect, the boys would not have let go their hold when I happened to sneeze, nor would my back have been broken. Thou speakest sooth, O Sheikh, said the Sultan and indeed thou hast made evident the weakness of thy wit. Then quoth he to the man who was cloven of mouth, And thou, the other, what was it split thy gape? The weakness of my wit, O my lord the sultan, quoth he, and fell into telling the story of the split-mouthed schoolmaster. Section 10 STORY OF THE SPLIT-MOUTHED SCHOOLMASTER I also began life, O King of the Age, as a schoolmaster, and had under my charge some eighty boys. Now I was strict with such strictness that from morning to evening I sat amongst them, and would never dismiss them to their homes before sundown. But tis known to thee, O our Lord the King, that boys' wits be short after the measure of their age, and that they love not save play and foregathering in the streets and quarter. Withal, I took no heed of this, and ever grew harder upon them, till one day all met, and with the intervention of the eldest monitor, they agreed and combined to play me a trick. He arranged with them that the next morning none should enter the school until he had taught them, each and every, to say as they went in, Thy safety, O our Lord, how yellow is thy face! Now the first who showed himself was the monitor, and he spoke as had been agreed, but I was rough with him and sent him away. Then a second came in and repeated what the first had said, then a third, then a fourth, till ten boys had used the same words. So quoth I to myself, Ho, oh, such an one! Thou must be unwell without weeding it. Then I rose and went into the harem, and lay down therein, when the monitor, having collected from his schoolfellows some hundred and eighty noofs, came in to me and cried, Take this, O our Lord, and expend the money upon thy health. Thereupon I said to myself, Ho, oh, such an one, every Thursday thou dost not collect sixty fadas from the boys. And I cried to him, Go let them forth for a holiday. So he went and dismissed them from school to the playground. On the next day he collected as much as on the first, and came in to me and said, Expend these monies, O our Lord, upon thy health. He did the same on the third day, and the fourth, making the boys contribute much coin and presenting it to me. And on such wise he continued till the tenth day, when he brought the money as was his wont. At that time I happened to hold in my hand a boiled egg, which I proposed eating. But on sighting him I said in myself, An he sees thee feeding, he will cut off the supplies. So I crammed the egg into my chops. And Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased to say her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Dunyazad, How sweet is thy story, O sister mine! 
and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixty-fourth night Danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the schoolmaster said to himself if the monitor see me eating an egg now in thy hand he will cut off the supplies and assert thee to be sound so continued he i crammed the egg into my chops and clamped my jaws together hereupon the lad turned to me and cried o oh my lord thy cheek is much swollen and i tis only an imposthume but he drew a whittle forth his sleeve and coming up to me seized my cheek and slid it when the egg fell out and he said o oh my lord this it was did harm and now tis passed away from thee such was the cause of the splitting of my mouth o oh, our lord the sultan now had i cast away greed of gain and eaten the egg in the monitor's presence what could have been the ill result but all this was of the weakness of my wit for also had i dismissed the boys every day about mid-afternoon i should have gained naught nor lost aught thereby however the dealer of destiny is self-existent and this is my case then the sultan turned to the wazir and laughed and said the fact is that whoso schooleth boys is weak of wit and said the other o king of the age all pedagogues lack perceptives and reflectives nor can they become legal witnesses before the kazi because verily they credit the words of little children without evidence of the speech being or factual or false so their reward in the world to come must be abounding then the sultan asked the limping man saying and thou the other who lamed thee so he began to tell the story of the limping schoolmaster section eleven the story of the limping schoolmaster my tale o my lord the sultan is marvellous and twas as follows my father was by profession a schoolmaster and when he fared to the ruth of almighty allah i took his place in the school and taught the boys to read after the fashion of my sire now over the schoolroom was an upper lattice where two planks had been nailed and i was ever casting looks at it till one chance day i said to myself by allah this lattice thus boarded up needs must contain hoards or monies or manuscripts which my father stored there before his decease and on such wise i am deprived of them so i arose and brought a ladder and lashed it to another till the two together reached the lattice and i clomb them holding a carpenter's adze wherewith i prized up the planks until all were removed and behold i then saw a large fowl to wit a kite setting upon her nestlings but when she saw me she flew sharply in my face and i was frightened by her and thrown back so i tumbled from the ladder top to the ground and brake both kneecaps then they bore me home and brought a leech to heal me but he did me no good and i fell into my present state now this o lord our sultan proveth the weakness of my wit and the greatness of my greed for there is a saw amongst men that saith covetous i wasteth and never gathereth so worthy of covetous such o lord of the age and the time is my tale hereupon the king bade gifts and largesse be distributed to the three old schoolmasters and when his bidding was obeyed they went their ways then the sultan turned to the minister and said o wazir now respecting the matter of the three maidens and their mother i would have thee make inquiry and find out their home and bring them hither or let us go to them in disguise and hear their history for indeed it must be wonderful 
otherwise how could they have understood that we served them that slight by marking their door and they on their part set marks of like kind upon all the doors of the quarter that we might lose the track and touch of them by allah this be rare intelligence on the part of these damsels but we o wazir will strive to come upon their traces then the minister fared forth after changing his dress and demeanour and walked to the quarter in question but found all the doors similarly marked so he was sore perplexed concerning his case and fell to questioning all the folk wont to pass by these doors but none could give him any information and he walked about sore distraught until eventide when he returned to the solvent without aught of profit as he went into the presence his liege lord asked him saying what bringest thou of tidings and he answered o king i have not found the property but there passed through my mind a stratagem which and we carry it out peradventure shall cause us to happen upon the maidens quoth the sultan what be that and quoth he do thou write me an autograph writ and give it to the crier that he may cry about the city whoso lighteth wick after supper tide shall have his head set under his heels the sultan rejoined thy reed is right accordingly on the next day the king wrote his letter and gave it to the crier bidding him fare through the city and forbid the lighting of lamps after night prayers and the man took the royal rescript and set it in a green bag then he went forth and cried about the street saying according to the commandment of our king the lord of prosperity and master of the necks of god's servants if any light wick after night prayers his head shall be set under his heels his good shall be spoiled and his women shall be cast into jail and the crier stinted not crying through the town during the first day and the second day and the third until he had gone round the whole place nor was there a citizen but who knew the ordinance now the king waited patiently till after the proclamation of the third day but on the fourth night he and his minister went down from the palace in disguise after supper-tide to pry about the wards and to spy into the lattices of the several quarters they found no light till they came to the ward where the three damsels lived and the sultan happening to glance in such a direction saw the gleam of a lamp in one of the tenements so he said to the wazir ho oh, there is a wick alight presently they drew near it and found that it was within one of the marked houses wherefore they came to a stand and knocked at the door and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixty-fifth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that when the sultan and the wazir stood over against the door behind which was the light and knocked at it the youngest of the sisters cried out who is at the door and they replied guests and our wishes she rejoined what can you want at this hour and what have belated you and they we be men living in a khan but we have lost our way thither and we fear to happen upon the chief of police so of your bountiful kindness open ye to us and house us for the remnant of the night and such charity shall gain you reward in heaven hereto the mother added go open to them the door and the youngest of the maidens came forward and opened to them and admitted them then the parent and her children rose up and welcomed them respectfully and seated them and did them honour and set before them somewhat of food which they ate and were gladdened presently the king said o damsels 
ye cannot but know that the sultan proclaimed for biddle of wick burning but ye have lighted your lamps and have not obeyed him when all the citizens have accepted his commandment upon this the youngest sister accosted him saying o darwish verily the sultan's order should not be obeyed save in commandments which be reasonable but this his proclamation forbidding lights is sinful to accept and indeed the right direction wherein man should walk is according to holy law which saith no obedience to the creature in a matter of sin against the creator the sultan allah make him prevail herein acteth against the law and imitateth the doings of satan for we be three sisters with our mother making four in the household and every night we sit together by lamplight and weave a half pound weight of linen web which our mother taketh in the morning for sale to the bazaar and buyeth us therewith half a pound of raw flax and with the remainder what sufficeth us of victual the sultan now turned to his minister and said o wazir this damsel astonisheth me by her questions and answers what case of causatry can we propose to her and what disputation can we set up do thou contrive us somewhat shall pose and perplex her o my lord replied the wazir we are here in the guise of darwishes and are become to these folk as guests how then can we disturb them with troublesome queries in their own home quoth the sultan needs must thou address them so the wazir said to the girl o noble one obeisance to the royal orders is incumbent upon you as upon all lieges said she true he is our sovereign but how can he know whether we be starving or full fed let us see rejoined the wazir when he shall send for you and set you before the presence and question you concerning your disobeying his orders what thou wilt say she retorted i would say to the sultan thou hast contraried holy law at this the minister resumed and he asked these sundry questions wilt thou answer them and she replied indeed i will hereat the minister turned to the king and said let us leave off question and answer with this maiden on points of conscience and holy law and ask if she understands the fine arts presently the sultan put the question when she replied how should i not understand them when i am their father and their mother quoth he allah upon thee o my lady and thou wouldst favour us let us hear one of thine airs and its words so she rose and retired but presently returning with the lute sat down and set it upon her lap and ordered the strings and smote it with a masterly touch then she fell to singing amongst other verses these ordered couplets do thou good to men and so rule their necks long reigns who by benefit rules mankind and led aid to him who for aidance hopes for i grateful is man with a noble mind who brings money the many to him will incline and money for tempting of man was designed who hindereth favour and bounties ne'er or brother or friend in creation shall find with harsh looks frown not in the sage's face disgusteth the free man denial and kind who frequenteth mankind all of good unknoweth man is leaf of rebellion of largesse loath when the sultan heard these couplets his mind was distraught and he was perplexed in thought then turning to his wazir he said by allah these lines were surely an examination of and an allusion to our two selves and doubtless she weeteth of us that i am the sultan and thou art the wazir for the whole tenor of her talk proveth her knowledge of us then he turned to the maiden and said right good are thy verse and thy voice and thy words have delighted us with exceeding delight upon this she sang the following two couplets men seek for them sorrow and toil through long years as they brightly flow but fate in the well like the tank firm fixed ruleth all below now as soon as the sultan heard these last two couplets he made certain that the damsel was aware of his quality she did not leave off her lute playing till near daylight 
when she rose and retired and presently brought in a breakfast befitting her degree for indeed she was pleased with them and when she served it up they ate a small matter which sufficed them after this she said inshallah you will return to us this night before supper tide and become our guests and the twain went their ways marvelling at the beauty of the sisters and their loveliness and their fearlessness in the matter of the proclamation and the sultan said to the wazir by allah my soul inclineth unto that maiden and they stinted not walking until they had entered the palace but when that day had gone by and evening drew nigh the monarch made ready to go he and the minister to the dwelling of the damsels and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixty-sixth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the king and the counsellor made ready to go to the dwelling of the damsels taking with them somewhat of gold pieces the time being half an hour after set of sun and presently they repaired to the house of the sisters whither they had been invited on the past night so they rapped at the door when the youngest maiden came to it and opened and let them in then she salaamed to them and greeted them and entreated them with increased respect saying welcome to our lords the darwishes but she eyed them with the eye of the physiognomist and said in herself verily these two men are on no wise what they seem and unless my caution and intelligence and power of knowledge have passed away from me this must be the sultan and that his wazir for grandeur and majesty are evident on them then she seated them and accosted them even more pleasantly and set before them supper and when they had eaten enough she brought basins and ewers for hand washing and served up coffee causing them to enjoy themselves and to give and take and talk till their pleasure was perfect at the time of night orisons they arose and after performing the wuzu ablution prayed and when their devotions were ended the sultan hent his hand in his purse and gave it to the youngest sister saying expend ye this upon your livelihood she took the bag which held two thousand dinars and kissed his right hand feeling yet the more convinced that he must be the sultan so she proved her respect by the fewness of her words as she stood between his hands to do him service also she privately winked at her sisters and mother and said to them by signs verily this be the monarch and that his minister the others then arose and followed suit as the sister had done when the sultan turned to the wazir and said the case is changed assuredly they have comprehended it and ascertained it presently adding to the girl o damsel we be only darwish folk and yet you all stand up in our service as if we were sovereigns i beseech you do not on this wise but the youngest sister again came forwards and kissed the ground before him and blessed him and recited this couplet fair fate befall thee to thy foes despite white be thy days and his be black as night by allah o king of the age thou art the sultan and that is the minister the sovereign asked what cause hast thou for supposing this and she answered from your grand demeanour and your majestic mien for such be the qualities of kings which cannot be concealed quoth the monarch thou hast spoken sooth but tell me how happeneth that you won here without men protectors and quoth she o my lord the king 
our history is wondrous and were it graven with graver needles upon the eye corners it were a warning to whoso would be warned he rejoined what is it and she began the story of the three sisters and their mother section twelve part one of the story of the three sisters and their mother I and my sisters and my mother are not natives of this city, but of a capital in the land, Al-Iraq, where my father was sovereign, having troops and guards, wazirs and eunuch chamberlains. And my mother was the fairest woman of her time, insomuch that her beauty was a proverb throughout each and every region. Now it chanced that when I and my sisters were but infants, our father would set out to hunt and course and slay beasts of raven and take his pleasure in the gardens throughout the city so he sent for his wazir and appointed and constituted him vice-regent in his stead with full authority to command and be gracious to his lieges then he got him ready and marched forth and the viceroy entered upon his office but it happened that it was the hot season, and my mother betook herself to the terrace roof of the palace in order to smell the air and sniff up the breeze. At that very hour, by the decree of the decreer, the wazir was sitting in the kiosk or roof balcony hanging to his upper mansion and holding in hand a mirror. And, as he looked therein, he saw the reflection of my mother, a glance of eyes which bequeathed him a thousand sighs. He was forthright distracted by her beauty and loveliness, and fell sick and took to his pillow. Presently a confidential nurse came in, and feeling his pulse, which showed no malady, said to him, No harm for thee, thou shalt soon be well, nor ever suffer from aught of sorrow. Quoth he, O my nurse, canst thou keep a secret? And quoth she, I can. Then he told her all the love he had conceived for my mother, and she replied, This be a light affair, nor hath it aught of hindrance. I will manage for thee such matter, and I will soon unite thee with her. Thereupon he packed up for her some of the most sumptuous dresses in his treasury, and said, Hie thee to her, and say, The wazir hath sent these to thee by way of love token, and his desire is either that thou come to him and converse, he and thou, for a couple of hours, or that he be allowed to visit thee. The nurse replied with, Hearkening and obedience, and fared forth and found my mother, and we little ones were before her, all unknowing aught of that business. So the old woman saluted her and brought forwards the dresses, and my mother arose, and opening the bundle, beheld sumptuous raiment and, amongst other valuables, a necklace of precious stones. So she said to the nurse, This is indeed ornamental gear, especially the collar. And said the nurse, O my lady, these are from thy slave the wazir, by way of love token, for he doteth on thee with extreme desire, and his only wish is to foregather with thee and converse, he and thou, for a couple of hours, either in his own place or in thine, whither he will come. Now when my mother heard these words from the nurse, she arose and drew a scimitar, which lay hard by, and of her angry hastiness made the old woman's head fall from her body, and bade her slave-girls pick up the pieces, and cast them in to the common privy of the palace. So they did her bidding, and wiped away the blood. Now the wazir abode expecting his nurse to return to him, but she returned not. So next day he dispatched another handmaid, who went to my mother and said to her, O my lady, our lord the wazir sent thee a present of dress by his nurse, but she hath not come back to him. Hereupon my mother bade her eunuchs take the slave and strangle her, then cast the corpse into the same house of easement where they had thrown the nurse. They did her bidding, but she said in her mind, Happily the wazir will return from the road of unright, and she kept his conduct a secret. He, however, fell every day to sending slave-girls with the same message, and my mother to slaying each and every, nor deign show him any signs of yielding. But she, O oh our lord the sultan, still kept her secret, and did not acquaint our father therewith, always saying to herself, Haply the wazir will return to the road of right. 
and behold, my father presently came back from hunting and sporting and pleasuring, when the lords of the land met him and salaamed to him, and amongst them appeared the minister whose case was changed. Now some years after this, O king of the age, our sire resolved upon a pilgrimage to the holy house of Mecca. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased saying her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Dunyazad, How sweet and tasteful is thy tale, O sister mine, and enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, And where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? Now, when it was the next night, and that was the three hundred and sixty-seventh night, Dunyazad said to her, Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy, finish for us thy tale, that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night. She replied, With love and good will. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the youngest sister continued to the sultan so our sire o king of the age resolved upon a pilgrimage to the holy house of mecca and established the same wazir vice-regent in his stead to deal commandment and break off and carry out so he said in his heart now have i won my will of the sultan's harem so the king got him ready and fared forth to Allah's holy house, after committing us to the charge of his minister. But when he had been gone ten days, and the wazir knew that he must be far from the city, where he had left behind him me and my sisters and my mother, behold, an eunuch of the ministers came in to us, and kissed ground before the queen, and said to her, Allah upon thee, O my lady, pity my lord the wazir, for his heart is melted by thy love, and his wits wander and his right mind, and he is now become as one annihilated. So do thou half ruth upon him, and revive his heart, and restore his health. Now when my mother heard these words, she bade her eunuch seize that castrato, and carry him from the room to the middle of the divan court, and there slay him. But she did so without divulging her reasons. They obeyed her bidding, and when the lords of the land and others saw the body of a man slain by the unitary of the palace, they informed the wazir, saying, What hateful business is this which hath befallen after the sultan's departure? He asked, What is to do? And they told him that his castrato had been slain by a party of the palace unitary. Thereupon he said to them, in your hand abideth testimony of this whenas the sultan shall return, and ye shall bear witness to it. But, O king, the wazir's passion for our mother waxed cool after the deaths of the nurse and the slave girls and the eunuch, and she also held her peace and spake not a word thereanent. On this wise time passed, and he sat in the stead of my sire, till the sultan's return drew near, when the minister dreaded lest our father, learning his ill deeds, should do him die. So he devised a device and wrote a letter to the king, saying, After salutation be it known to thee, that thy harem hath sent to me, not only once but five several times during thine absence, soliciting me of a foul action, to which I refused consent and replied, By Allah, however much she may wish to betray my sovereign, I, by the Almighty, will not turn traitor. For that I was left by three guardians of the realm after thy departure. He added words upon words. Then he sealed the scroll and gave it to a running courier with orders to hurry along the road. The messenger took it and fared with it to the sultan's camp when distant eight days' journey from the capital, and finding him seated in his pavilion, delivered the writ. He took it and opened it and read it, and when he understood its secret significance, his face changed, his eyes turned backwards, and he bade his tents be struck for departure. So they fared by force marches till between him and his capital remained only two stations. He then summoned two chamberlains with orders to forego him to the city and take my mother and us three girls a day's distance from it, and there put us to death. 
accordingly they led us four to open country proposing to kill us and my mother knew not what intent was in their minds until they reached the appointed spot now the queen had in times past heaped alms deeds and largesse upon the two chamberlains so they held the case to be a grievous and said each to other by allah we cannot slaughter them no never then they told my mother of the letter which the wazir had written to our father saying such and such upon which she exclaimed he hath lied by allah the arch traitor and not happened save so and so then she related to them all she had done with the exactest truth the men said sooth thou hast spoken then arising without stay or delay they snared a gazelle and slaughtered it and filled with its blood four flasks after which they broiled some of the flesh over the embers and gave it to my mother that we might satisfy our hunger presently they farewelled us saying we give you in charge of him who never disappointed those committed to his care and lastly they went their ways leaving us alone in the wild and the wold so we fell to eating the desert grasses and drinking of the remnants of the rain and we walked a while and rested a while without finding any city or inhabited region and we waxed tired o king of the age when suddenly we came upon a spot on a hill flank abounding in very colored herbs and fair fountains here we abode ten days and behold a caravan drew near us and encamped hard by us but they did not sight us for that we hid ourselves from their view until night fell then i went to them and asked of sundry eunuchs and ascertained that there was a city at the distance of two days march from us so i returned and informed my mother who rejoiced at the good tidings as soon as it was morn the caravan marched off so we four arose and walked all that day through at a leisurely pace and a second day and so forth until on the afternoon of the fifth a city rose before our sight fulfilling all our desires and we exclaimed alhamdulillah laud be to the lord who hath empowered us to reach it we ceased not faring till sunset when we entered it and found it a potent capital such was our case and that of our mother but as regards our sire the sultan as he drew near his home after the return journey from the Hajj, the lords of the land and the chiefs of the city flocked out to meet him and the town folk followed one another like men riding on pillions to salute him and the poor and the mesquin congratulated him on his safety and at last the wazir made his appearance the sultan desired to be private with the minister and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixty-eighth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the king desired to be private with the minister and when they were left alone he said o wazir how was it between thee and that harem of mine said the other o king of the age she sent to me not only once but five several times and i refrained from her and whatsoever eunuch she dispatched i slew saying happily she may cease so doing and abandon her evil intent but she did not repent so i feared for thine honour and sent to acquaint thee with the matter the sultan bowed his head groundwards for a while then raising it he bade summon the two chamberlains whom he had sent to slay his wife and three children upon their appearing he asked them what have you done in fulfilling my commandment they answered we did that which thou bade us be done and showed him the four flasks they had filled with the blood and said this be their blood a flask full from each 
the sultan hent them in hand and mused over what had taken place between him and his wife of love and affection and union so he wept with bitter weeping and fell down in a fainting fit after an hour or so he recovered and turning to the wazir said tell me hast thou spoken sooth and the other replied yes i have then the sultan addressed the two chamberlains and asked them have ye put to death my daughters with their mother but they remained silent nor made aught of answer or address so he exclaimed what is on your minds that ye speak not they rejoined by allah o king of the age the honest man cannot tell an untruth for that lying and leasing are the characteristics of hypocrites and traitors when the wazir heard the chamberlain's speech his color yellowed his frame was disordered and a trembling seized his limbs and the king turned to him and noted that these symptoms had been caused by the words of the two officials so he continued to them what mean ye o chamberlains by your saying that lies and leasing are the characteristics of hypocrites and traitors can it be that ye have not put them to death and as ye claim to be true men either ye have killed them and ye speak thus or you are liars now by him who hath set me upon the necks of his lieges if ye declare not to tell me the truth i will do you both die by the foulest of deaths they rejoined by allah o king of the age when as thou badest us take them and slay them we obeyed thy bidding and they knew not nor could they divine what was to be until we arrived with them at the middlemost and broadest of the desert and when we informed them of what had been done by the wazir thy harem exclaimed there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great verily we are allah's and unto him we are returning but an ye kill us ye will kill us wrongfully and ye wot not wherefore by the lord this wazir hath foully lied and hath accused us falsely before the almighty so he said to her o king of the age inform us of what really took place and said the mother of the princesses thus and thus it happened then she fell to telling us the whole tale from first to last of the nurse who was sent to her and the handmaids and the eunuch hereupon the sultan cried and ye have ye slain them or not and the chamberlain replied by allah o king of the age when as the loyalty of thy harem was made manifest to us we snared a gazelle and cut its throat and filled these four flasks with its blood after which we broiled some of the flesh upon the embers and offered it to thy harem and her children saying to them we give thee in charge to him who never disappointeth those committed to his care and we added your truth shall save you lastly we left them in the midmost of the waste and we returned hither when the sultan heard these words he turned to the wazir and exclaimed thou hast estranged me from my wife and my children but the minister uttered not a word nor made any address and trembled in every limb like one afflicted with an ague and when the king saw the truth of the chamberlains and the treachery of the minister he bade fuel be collected and set on fire and they did his bidding then he commanded them to truss up the wazir hand tied to foot and bind him perforce upon a catapult and cast him into the middle of the fiery pyre which made his bones melt before his flesh lastly he ordered his palace to be pillaged his good to be spoiled and the women of his harem to be sold for slaves after this he said to his chamberlains you must know the spot wherein you left the queen and the princesses and said they o king of the age we know it well but when we abandoned them and returned home they were in the midst of the wolds and the wilds nor can we say what befell them or whether they be now alive or dead on this wise fared it with them but as regards us three maidens and our mother when we entered the city and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and sixty-ninth night dunyazad said to her 
Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy. Finish for us thy tale, that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night. She replied, With love and good will. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed, which is benefiting, and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating, that the youngest sister continued her tale. So when we three maidens and our mother entered the city about sunset, I the youngest said to them, We be three princesses and a queen mother, so we cannot show ourselves in this our condition, and needs must we lodge us in a con. Also tis my rede that we should do best by donning boys' dress. All agreeing hereto we did accordingly, and entering a caravansary, hired us a retired chamber in one of the wings. Now every day we three fared forth the service, and at eventide we foregathered and took what sufficed us of sustenance. But our semblance had changed with the travails of travel, and all who looked at us would say, These be lads. In this plight we passed for the space of a year, full told, till one day of the days. We three fared forth to our chars, as was our wont, and behold, a young man met us upon the way, and turning to me asked, O lad, wilt thou serve in my house? Quoth I, O my uncle, I must ask advice. And quoth he, O my lad, crave counsel of thy mother, and come and serve in our home. He then looked at my sisters, and inquired, Be these thy comrades, O lad? And I replied, No, they are my brothers. So we three went to our mother in the khan, and asked to her, this young man wisheth to hire the youngest of us for service and said she no harm in that thereupon the youth arose and taking me by the hand guided me to his home and led me in to his mother and his wife and when the ancient dame saw me her heart was open to me presently quoth the young man to his parent i have brought the lad to serve in our house and he hath two brothers and his mother dwelling with them quoth she may it be fortunate to thee o my son so i tarried there serving them till sunset and when the evening meal was eaten they gave me a dish of meat and three large bannocks of clean bread these i took and carried to my mother whom i found sitting with my sisters and i set before them the meat and bread but when my parents saw this she wept with sore weeping and cried time hath overlooked us erst we gave food to the folk and now the folk send us food and cried I, Marvel not at the works of the Creator, for verily Allah hath ordered for us this, and for others that, and the world endureth not for any one. And I ceased not soothing my mother's heart till it waxed clear of trouble, and we ate and praised Almighty Allah. Now every day I went forth to serve at the young man's house, and at eventide bore to my mother and sisters their sufficiency of food for supper, breakfast, and dinner and when the youth brought eatables of any kind for me i would distribute it to the family and he looked well after our wants and at times he would supply clothing for me and for the youths my sisters and for my parent so that all hearts in our lodgings were full of affection for him at last his mother said what need is there for the lad to go forth from us every eventide and pass the night with his people let him lie in our home, and every day about noontime carry the evening meal to his mother and brothers, and then return to us and keep me company. I replied, O oh, my lady, let me consult my mother, to whom I will fare forthright and acquaint her herewith. But my parent objected, saying, O oh, my daughter, we fear lest thou be discovered, and they find thee out to be a girl. I replied, Our Lord will veil our secret. And she rejoined, Then do thou obey them. So I lay with the young man's mother, nor did any divine that I was a maid. Albeit from the time when I entered into that youth's service, my strength and comeliness had increased. At last, one night of the nights, I went after supper to sleep at my employer's, and the young man's mother chanced to glance in my direction, when she saw my loosed hair which gleamed and glistened many-coloured as a peacock's robe. 
next morning i arose and gathering up my locks donned the takaya and proceeded as usual to do service about the house never suspecting that the mother had taken notice of my hair presently she said to her son tis my wish that thou buy me a few rose blossoms which be fresh he asked to make conserve and she answered no then he inquired wherefore wantest thou roses and she replied by allah o my son i wish herewith to try this our servant whom i suspect to be a girl and no boy and under him in bed i would strew rose leaves for an they be found wilted in the morning he is a lad and if they remain as they were he is a lass so he fared forth and presently returned to his mother with the rose blossoms and when the sleeping hour came she went and placed them in my bed i slept well and in the morning when i rose she came to me and found that the petals had not changed for the worse nay they had gained lustre so she made sure that i was a girl and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventieth night section thirteen part two of the story of three sisters and their mother the three hundred and seventieth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the damsel continued so the young man's mother made certain that her certain lad was a virgin lass but she concealed her secret from her son and was kind to me and showed me respect and of the goodness of her heart sent me back early to my mother and sisters now one day of the days the youth came home about noon as was his wont and he found me with sleeves tucked up to the elbows engaged in washing a bundle of shirts and turbans and i was careless of myself so he drew near me and noted my cheeks that flushed rosy red and eyes which were as those of the thirsty gazelle and my scorpion locks hanging adown my side face this took place in summer-tide and when he saw me thus his wits were distraught and his sound senses were as naught and his judgment was in default so he went in to his parent and said to her o oh, my mother indeed this servant is no boy but a maiden girl and my wish is that thou discover for me her case and make manifest to me her condition and marry me to her for that my heart is fulfilled of her love now by the decree of the decreer i was privily listening to all they said of me so presently i arose after washing the clothes and what else they had given me but my state was changed by their talk and i knew and felt certified that the youth and his mother had recognized me for a girl i continued on this wise till eventide when i took the food and returned to my family and they all ate till they had eaten enough when i told them my adventure and my conviction so my mother said to me what remaineth for us now to do and said i o my mother let us arise we three before night shall set in and go forth ere they lock the khan upon us and if the doorkeeper asks us aught let us answer we are faring to spend the night in the house of the youth where our son is serving my mother replied right indeed is thy reed accordingly all four of us went forth at the same time and when the porter asked this is the night tide and whither may ye be wending we answered we have been invited by the young man whom our son serveth for he maketh a septina festival and a bridal feast so we propose to-night with him and return a morn quoth he there is no harm in that so we issued out and turned aside and sought the wastelands the valor veiling us 
and we ceased not walking till the daybreak, and we were sore awearied. Then we sat for rest till the rise of sun, and when it shone we four sprang up and strave with our wayfare throughout the first day, and the second, and the third, until the seventh. Now all this was related to Mohammed the Sultan of Cairo and his wazir by the youngest princess, and they abode wondering at her words. On the seventh day we reached this city, and here we housed ourselves. But to this hour we have no news of our sire, after the minister was burnt, nor do we know, and he be whole or dead. Yet we yearn for him, so do thou, of thine abundant favor, O king of the age, and thy perfect beneficence. Send a messenger to seek tidings of him, and to acquaint him with our case, when he will send to fetch us. Here she ceased speaking, and the monarch and minister both wondered at her words, and exclaimed, Exalted be he who decreeth to his servants severance and reunion. Then the sultan of Cairo arose without stay or delay, and wrote letters to the king of al Rak, the father of the damsels, telling him that he had taken them under his safeguard, them and their mother, and gave the writ to the sheikh of the Cossids, and appointed for it a running courier, and sent him forth with it to the desert. After this the king took the three maidens and their mother, and carried them to his palace, where he set apart for them an apartment, and he appointed for them what sufficed of appointments. Now, as for the Cossid who fared forth with the letter, he stinted not spanning the waste for the space of two months, till he made the city of the bereaved king of Iraq, and when he asked for the royal whereabouts, they pointed out to him a pleasure garden. So he repaired thither, and went to him, kissed the ground before him, offered his services, prayed for him, and lastly handed to him the letter. The king took it, and brake the seal, and opened the scroll. But when he read it, and comprehended its contents, he rose up and shrieked a loud shriek, and fell to the floor in a fainting fit. So the high officials flocked around him, and raised him from the ground, and when he recovered after an hour or so, they questioned him concerning the cause of this. He then related to them the adventures of his wife and children, how they were still in the bonds of life whole and hearty, and forthright he ordered a ship to be got ready for them, and stored therein gifts and presents for him, who had been the guardian of his queen and her daughters. But he knew not what lurked for them in the future, so the ship sailed away, all on board seeking the desired city, and she reached it without delay, the winds blowing light and fair. Then she fired the cannon of safe arrival, and the sultan sent forth to inquire concerning her. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased saying her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Dunyazad, How sweet and tasteful is thy tale, O sister mine! and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventy-first night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied, With love and good will. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed, which is benefiting, and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating, that the sultan made inquiries concerning that ship, when, behold, the rays came forth from her to the land, and accosting the king, handed to him the letter, and acquainted him with the arrival of the gifts and presents whereupon he bade all on board her come ashore, and be received in the guest-house for a space of three days, until the traces of travel should disappear from them. After that time the sultan got ready whatso became his high degree of offerings, even in those dispatched to him by the father of the damsels, and stowed them in the vessel, where he also embarked as much of victual and provant as might suffice for all the voyagers. On the fourth day after sunset, the damsels and their mother were borne on board, and likewise went to the master, after they had taken leave of the king, and had salaamed to him, and prayed for his preservation. Now in early morning the breeze blew free and fair, 
so they loosed the sail and made for the back of the sea and voyaged safely for the first day and the second but on the third about mid-noon a furious gale came out against them whereby the sails were torn to tatters and the masts fell overboard so the crew made certain of death and the ship ceased not to be tossed upwards and to settle down without mast or sail till midnight all the folk lamenting one to other as did the maidens and their mother till the wreck was driven upon an island and there went to pieces then he whose life term was short died forthright and he whose life term was long survived and some bestrode planks and others butts and others again bulks of timber whereby all were separated from each other now the mother and two of the daughters clomb upon planks and they chanced find and sought their safety but the youngest of the maidens who had mounted a keg and knew nothing of her mother and sisters was carried up and cast down by the waves for the space of five days till she landed upon an extensive seaboard where she found a sufficiency to eat and drink she sat down upon the shore for an hour of time till she had taken rest and her heart was calmed and her fear had flown and she had recovered her spirits then she rose and paced the sands all unknowing whither she should wend and whenever she came upon aught of herbs she would eat of them this lasted through the first day and the second till the forenoon of the third when lo and behold a knight advanced towards her falcon on his fist and followed by a greyhound for three days he had been wandering about the waste questing game either of birds or of beasts but he had happened not upon either when he chanced to meet the maiden and seeing her said in his mind by allah yon damsel is my quarry this very day so he drew nearer and slom to her and she returned his salute whereupon he asked her of her condition and she informed him of what had betided her and his heart was softened towards her and taking her up on his horse's crupper he turned him homewards now of this youngest sister quoth shahrazad there is much to say and we will say it when the tale shall require the telling but as regards the second princess she ceased not floating on the plank for the space of eight days until she was borne by the set of the sea close under the walls of a city but she was like one drunken with wine when she crawled up the shore and her raiment was in rags and her colour had waned for excess of affright however she walked onwards at a slow pace till she reached the city and came upon a house of low stone walls so she went in and there finding an ancient dame sitting and spinning yarn she gave her good evening and the other returned it adding who art thou o my daughter and whence comest thou she answered o my aunt i am fallen from the skies and have been met by the earth thou needest not question me of aught for my heart is clean molten by the fire of grief and thou take me in for love and kindness tis well and if not i will again fare forth on my wanderings when the woman heard these words she compassioned the maiden and her heart felt tender towards her and she cried welcome to thee o my daughter sit thee down accordingly she sat her down beside her hostess and the two fell to spinning yarn whereby to gain their daily bread and the old dame rejoiced in her mind and said she shall take the place of my daughter now of this second princess quoth shahrazad there is much to say and we will say it when the tale shall require the telling but as regards the eldest sister she ceased not clinging to the plank and floating over the sea till the sixth day passed and on the seventh she was cast upon a stead where lay gardens distant from the town six miles so she walked into them and seeing fruit close clustering she took it and ate and donned the cast-off dress of a man she found near hand then she kept on faring till she entered the town and here she fell to wandering about the bazaars till she came to the shop of a kunafa maker who was cooking his vermicelli and he seeing a fair youth in man's habit said to her o yunker wilt thou be my servant o oh, my uncle she said i will well so she settled her wage each day a quarter farthing not including her diet 
Now in that town were some fifteen shops wherein Kunafa was made. She abode with the confectioner the first day and the second, and the third to the full number of ten, when the traces of travel left her, and fear departed from her heart, and her favor and complexion were changed for the better, and she became even as the moon, nor could any guess that the lad was a lass. Now it was the practice of that man to buy every day half a quartern of flour, and use it for making his vermicelli. But when the soul-seeming youth came to him, he would lay in each morning three quarterns. And the town folk heard of this change, and fell to saying, We will never dine without the kunafa of the confectioner who hath in his house the youth. This is what befell the eldest princess, of whom, quoth Shahrazad, there is much to say, and we will say it when the tale shall require the telling. But as regards the queen mother, and Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased to say her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Dunyazad, How sweet is thy story, O sister mine, and how enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, And where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? Now, when it was the next night, and that was the three hundred and seventy-second night, Dunyazad said to her, Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy, finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that as regards the mother of the maidens when the ship broke up under them and she bestrode the bulk of timber she came upon the race in his boat manned by three of the men so he took her on board and they ceased not paddling for a space of three days when they sighted a lofty island which fulfilled their desire and its summit towered high in air so they made for it till they drew near it and landed on a low side shore where they abandoned their boat and they ceased not walking through the rest of that day and those that followed till one day of the days behold a dust cloud suddenly appeared to them spiring up to the skies they fared for it and after a while it lifted showing beneath it a host with swords glancing and lance heads gleams lancing and war steeds dancing and prancing and these were ridden by men like unto eagles and the host was under the hands of a sultan around whom ensigns and banners were flying and when this king saw the race and the sailors and the woman following he wheeled his charger themwards to learn what tidings they brought and rode up to the strangers and questioned them and the castaways informed them that their ship had broken up under them now the cause of this host taking the field was that the king of alarak the father of the three maidens after he appointed the ship and saw her set out fell uneasy at heart presaging evil and feared with sore fear the shifts of time so he went forth he and his high officials and his host and marched adown the long shore till by the decree of the decreer he suddenly and all unexpectedly came upon his queen who was under the charge of the ship's captain presently seeing the cavalcade and its ensigns the rays went forward and recognizing the king hastened up to him and kissed his stirrup and his feet the sultan turned towards him and knew him so he asked him of his state and the race answered by relating all that had befallen him thereupon the king commanded his power to alight in that place and they did so and set up their tents and pavilions then the sultan took seat in his shamiana and bade them bring his queen and they brought her and when i met i the pair greeted each other fondly and the father asked concerning her three children she declared that she had no tidings of them after the shipwreck and she knew not whether they were dead or alive hereat the king wept with sore weeping and exclaimed verily we are allah's and unto him we are returning after which he gave orders to march from that place upon his capital accordingly they stinted not faring for a space of four days till they reached the city and he entered his citadel palace 
but every time and every hour he was engrossed in pondering the affair of the three princesses and kept saying would heaven i wot are they drowned or did they escape the sea and if they were saved oh that i knew whether they were scattered or abode in company of one with other and whatever else may have betided them and he ceased not brooding over the issue of things and kept addressing himself in speech and neither meat was pleasant to him nor drink such were his case and adventure but as regards the youngest sister when as she was met by the knight and seated upon the crupper of his steed he ceased not riding with her till he reached his city and went into a citadel palace now the knight was the son of a sultan who had lately deceased but a usurper had seized the reins of rule in his stead and time had proved a tyrant to the youth who had therefore addicted himself to hunting and sporting now by the decree of the decreer he had ridden forth to the chase where he met the princess and took her up behind him and at the end of the ride when he returned to his mother he was becharmed by her charms so he gave her in charge to his parent and honoured her with the high most possible honour and felt for her a growing fondness even as felt she for him and when the girl had tarried with them a month full told she increased in beauty and loveliness and symmetrical stature and perfect grace then the heart of the youth was fulfilled with love of her and on likewise was the soul of the damsel who in her new affection forgot her mother and her sisters but from the moment that maiden entered his palace the fortunes of the young king amended and the world waxed propitious to him nor less did the hearts of the lieges incline to him so they held a meeting and said there shall be over us no sovereign and no sultan save the son of our late king and he who at this present ruleth us hath neither great wealth nor just claim to the sovereignty now all this benefit which accrued to the young king was by the auspicious coming of the princess presently the case was agreed upon by all the citizens of the capital that on the morning of the next day they would make him ruler and depose the usurper and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventy-third night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the citizens in early morning held a meeting whereat were present the lords of the land and the high officials and they went in to the usurping sultan determined to remove and dispose him but he refused and forswore consent saying by allah such thing may not be except after battle and slaughter accordingly they fared forth and acquainted the young king who had held the matter grievous and was overridden by cark and care however he said to them if there must perforce be fighting and killing i have treasuries sufficient to levy a host so by saying he went away and disappeared but presently he brought them monies which they distributed to the troops then they repaired to the maidan the field of fight outside the city and on like guise the usurping sultan rode out with all his power and when the two opposing hosts were ranged in their forces each right ready for the fray the usurper and his men charged home upon the young king and either side engaged in fierce combat and sore slaughter befell but the usurper had the better of the battle and proposed to seize the young king amidst his many when lo and behold appeared a knight backing a coal black mare and he was armed cap of pie in a coat of mail and he carried a spear and a mace 
with these he bore down upon the usurper and shore off his right forearm so that he fell from his destrier and the knight seeing this struck him a second stroke with a sword and parted head from body when his army saw the usurper fall all sought safety in flight and suave capui but the army of the young king came up with them and caused the scimitar to fall upon them so that were saved of them only those to whom length of life was foreordained hereupon the victors lost no time in gathering the spoils and the horses together but the young king stood gazing at the knight and considering his prowess yet he failed to recognize him and after an hour or so the stranger disappeared leaving the conqueror sorely chafed and vexed for that he knew him not and had failed to foregather with him after this the young king returned from the battlefield with his band plain behind him and he entered the seat of his power and was raised by the lieges to the station of his sire those who had escaped the slaughter dispersed in all directions and sought safety in flight and the partisans who had enthroned the young king thronged around him and gave him joy as also did the general of the city whose rejoicings were increased thereby now the coming of the aforesaid knight was a wondrous matter when the rightful king made ready for battle the princess feared for his life and being skilled in the practice of every weapon she escaped the notice of the queen dowager and after donning her war garb and battle gear she went forth to the stable and saddled her mare and mounted her and pushed in between the two armies as soon as she saw the usurper charge down upon the young king as one determined to shed his life's blood she forestalled him and attacked him and tore out the life from between his ribs then she returned to her apartment nor did any know of the deed she had done presently when it was eventide the young king entered the palace after securing his succession to royalty but he was still chafed and vexed for that he knew not the knight his mother met him and gave him joy of his safety and his ascension to the sultanate whereto he made reply ah o oh my mother my length of days was from the hand of a horseman who suddenly appearing joined us in our hardest stress and aided me in my straitest need and saved me from death quoth she o my son hast thou recognized him and quoth he twas my best desire to discover him and to establish him as my wazir but this i failed to do now when the princess heard these words she laughed and rejoiced and still laughing said to whoso will make thee acquainted with him and what wilt thou give and said he dost thou know him so she replied i wot him not and he rejoined then what is the meaning of these thy words when she answered him in these prosaic rhymes o my lord may i prove thy sacrifice nor exalt at thy sorrows thine enemies could unease and disease by others be borne the slave should bear load on his lord that lies i'll carry whatever makes thee complain and be my body the first that dies when he heard these words he again asked dost thou know him and she answered he verily we wot him not and repeated saying to him a second time withal he by no means understood her so quoth she how canst thou administer the sultanate and yet fail to comprehend my simple words for indeed i have made the case clear to thee hereupon he fathomed the secret of the saying and flew to her in his joy and clasped her to his bosom and kissed her upon the cheeks but his mother turned to him and said o my son do not on this wise for everything hath its time and season and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventy-fourth night. Section 14 Part 3 of the story of Three Sisters and Their Mother 
the three hundred and seventy-fourth night Danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan's mother said o my son everything hath its time and season and whoso hurrieth the matter before opportunity befit shall be punished with the loss of it but he replied by allah o my mother thy suspicion is misplaced i acted thus only on my gratitude for her for assuredly she is the knight who came to my aidance and who saved me from death and his mother excused him they passed that night in converse and next day at noontide the king sought the divan in order to issue his commandments but when the assembly filled the room and became as a garden of bloom the lords of the land said to him o king of the age twere not suitable that thou become sultan except thou take thee a wife and alhamdulillah laud to the lord who hath set thee on the necks of his servants and who hath restored the realm to thee as successor of thy sire there is no help but thou marry quoth he to hear is to consent then he arose without stay or delay and went into his mother and related to her what had happened quoth she o my son do what becometh thee and allah prosper thy affairs he said to her o my mother retire thou with the maiden and persuade her to marriage for i want none other and i love not aught save herself and said she with joy and gladness so he went from her and she arose and was private with the damsel when she addressed her o my lady the king desireth to wed thee and he wanteth none other and he seeketh not aught save thee but the princess hearing this exclaimed how shall i marry i who have lost my kith and kin and my dear ones and am driven from my country and my birthplace this were a proceeding opposed to propriety but if it need must be and i have the fortune to foregather with my mother and sisters and father then and then only it shall take place the mother replied why this delay o my daughter the lords of the land have stood up against the king in the matter of marriage and in the absence of espousals we fear for his deposition now maidens be many and the relations long to see each damsel wedded to my son and become a queen in virtue of her husband's degree but he wanteth none other and loveth not save thyself accordingly and thou wouldst take compassion on him and protect him by thy consent from the insistence of the grandees deign accept him to mate nor did the sultan's mother cease to speak soothing words to the maiden and to gentle her with soft language until her mind was made up and she gave consent upon this they began to prepare for the ceremony forthright and summoned the kazi and witnesses who duly knotted the knot of wedlock and by eventide the glad tidings of the espousals were bruited abroad the king bade spread bride feasts and banqueting tables and invited his high officials and the grandees of the kingdom and he went in to the maiden that very night and the rejoicings grew in gladness and all sorrows ceased to deal sadness then he proclaimed through the capital and all the burghs that the lieges should decorate the streets with rare tapestries and multiform in honor of the sultanate accordingly they adorned the thoroughfares in the city and its suburbs for forty days and the rejoicings increased when the king fed the widows and the fakers and the mesquin and scattered gold and robed and gifted and largesse till all the days of decoration were gone by on this wise the sky of his estate grew clear by the loyalty of the lieges and he gave orders to deal justice after the fashion of the older sultans to wit the chosroes and the caesars and this condition endured for three years 
during which almighty allah blessed him by the princess with two men children as they were moons such was the case with the youngest princess but as regards the cadet the second sister and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased saying her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet and tasteful is thy tale o sister mine and enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventy-fifth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that as regards the case of the cadet the second damsel when she was adopted to daughter by the ancient dame she fell to spinning with her and living by the work of her hands now there chanced to govern that city a basha who had sickened with a sore sickness till he was near unto death and the wise men and leeches had compounded for him of medicines a mighty matter which however availed him not at last the tidings came to the ears of the princess who lived with the old woman and she said to her o my mother i desire to prepare a tassa of broth and do thou bear it to the basha and let him drink of it haply will almighty allah vouchsafe him a cure whereby we shall gain some good said the other o my daughter and how shall i obtain admittance and who shall set the broth before him the maiden replied o my mother at the gate of allah almighty and the dame rejoined do thou whatso thou willest so the damsel arose and cooked a toss of broth and mingled it with sundry hot spices such as pimento and she had certain leaflets taken from the so-called wind tree whereof she inserted a small portion deftly mingling the ingredients then the old woman took it and set forth and walked till she reached the bosch's mansion where the servants and eunuchs met her and asked her of what was with her she answered this is a toss of broth which i have brought for the basha that he drink of it as much as he may fancy haply almighty allah shall vouchsafe healing to him they went in and reported that to the basha who exclaimed bring her to me hither accordingly they led her within and she offered to him the toss of broth whereupon he arose and sat upright and removed the cover from the cup which set forth a pleasant savour so he took it and sipped of it a spoonful and a second and a third when his heart opened to her and he drank of it till he could no more now this was in the forenoon and after finishing the soup he gave the old woman a somewhat of dinars which she took and returned therewith to the damsel rejoicing and handed to her the gold pieces but the basha immediately after drinking the broth felt drowsy and he slept a restful sleep till mid-afternoon and when he awoke health had returned to his frame beginning from the time he drank so he asked after the ancient dame and sent her word to prepare for him another toss of broth like the first but they told him that none knew her dwelling place now when the old woman returned home the maiden asked her whether the broth had pleased the basha or not and she said that it was very much to his liking so the girl got ready a second portion but without all the stronger ingredients of the first then she gave it to the dame who took it and went forth with it and whilst the basha was asking for her behold up she came and the servants took her and led her to the governor on seeing her he rose and sat upright and called for other food and when it was brought he ate his sufficiency albeit for a length of time he could neither rise nor walk 
but from the hour he drank all the broth he sniffed the scent of health and he could move about as he moved when hale and hearty so he asked the old dame saying didst thou cook this broth and she answered o oh, my lord my daughter made it and sent me with it to thee he exclaimed by allah this maiden cannot be thy daughter old woman and she can be not save the daughter of kings but bid her every day at morning tide cook me a toss of the same broth the other replied to hear is to obey and returned home with this message to the damsel who did as the basha bade the first day and the second to the seventh day and the basha waxed stronger every day and when the week was ended he took horse and rode to his pleasure garden he increased continually in force and vigor till one day of the days he sent for the dame and questioned her concerning the damsel who lived with her so she acquainted him with her case and what there was in her of beauty and loveliness and perfect grace thereupon the basha fell in love with the girl by hearsay and without eye seeing and Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventy-sixth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the basha fell in love with the girl by hearsay and without eye seeing so he changed his habit and donning a dress of darwish cut left his mansion and threaded the streets passing from house to house until he reached that of the old woman then he knocked at the entrance and she came behind it and asked who's at the door a darwish and a stranger answered he who knoweth no man in this town and who is sore and hungered now the ancient dame was by nature niggardly and she had leaf put him off but the damsel said to her turn him not away and quoting honour to the foreigner is a duty said so do thou let him in she admitted him and seated him when the maiden brought him a somewhat of food and stood before him in his service he ate one time and ten times he gazed at the girl until he had eaten his sufficiency when he washed his hands and rising left the house and went his ways but his heart flamed with love of the princess and he was deeply enamoured of her and he ceased not walking until he reached his mansion whence he sent for the old woman and when they brought her he produced a mint of money and a sumptuous dress in which he requested and prayed her to attire the damsel then the old woman took it and returned to her protege saying to herself by allah if the girl accept the basha and marry him she will prove sensible as fortunate but an she be not content so to do i will turn her out of my door when she went in she gave her the dress and bade her don it but the damsel refused till the old woman coaxed her and persuaded her to try it on now when the dame left the basha he privily assumed a woman's habit and followed in her footsteps and at last he entered the house close behind her and beheld the princess in the sumptuous dress then the fire of his desire flamed higher in his heart and he lacked patience to part from her so he returned to his mansion with mind preoccupied and vitals yearning thither he summoned the old woman and asked her to demand the girl in marriage and was instant with her and cried no help but this must be accordingly she returned home and acquainted the girl with what had taken place adding o my daughter verily the basha loveth thee and his wish is to wed thee 
he hath been a benefactor to us, and thou wilt never meet his like, for that he is deeply enamoured of thee, and the byword saith, Reward of love is return of love. And the ancient dame ceased not gentling her, and plying her with friendly words, till she was soothed and gave consent. Then she returned to the basha and informed him of her success. So he joyed with exceeding joy, and without stay or delay, bade slaughter beeves and prepare bridal feasts and spread banquets, whereto he invited the notables of his government. After which he summoned the Kazi who tied the knot, and he went in to her that night. And of the abundance of his love he fared not forth from her till seven days had sped, and he ceased not to cohabit with her for a span of five years, during which Allah vouchsafed to him a man-child by her and two daughters. Such was the case with the cadet princess, but as regards the eldest sister, when she entered the city in youth's attire, she was accosted by the Kunafa baker, and was hired for a daily wage of a middy of silver besides her meat and drink in his house. Now t'was the practice of that man every day to buy half a quartern of flour and thereof make his vermicelli. But when the soul-seeming youth came to him, he would buy and work up three quarterns, and all the folk who bought kunafa of him would flock to his shop with a view of gazing upon the beauty and loveliness of the youth, and said, Exalted be he who created and perfected what he wrought in the creation of this young man. Now by the decree of the decreer, the baker's shop faced the lattice windows of the sultan's palace, and one day of the days the king's daughter chanced to look out the window, and she saw the youth standing with his sleeves tucked up from arms, which shone like ingots of silver. Hereat the princess fell in love with the youth, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased saying her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Dunyazad, How sweet and tasteful is thy tale, O sister mine, and enjoyable and delectable. Quoth she, And where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? Now, when it was the next night, and that was the three hundred and seventy-seventh night, Dunyazad said to her, Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that when the sultan's daughter looked out at the window she fell in love with the youth and she knew not how to act that she might foregather with him so desire afflicted her and extreme fondness and presently took her to pillow all for her affection to that young man thereupon her nurse went in to her and found her lying upon the carpet bed a moaning and a groaning ah so she exclaimed thy safety from all whereof thou hast to complain then she took her hand and felt her pulse but could find in it no symptoms of sickness bodily whereupon she said o my lady thou hast no unease save what eyesight hath brought thee she replied o my mother do thou keep sacred my secret and if thy hand can reach so far as to bring me my desire pray thee do so and the nurse rejoined o my lady like me who can keep a secret Therefore confide to me thy longing, and Allah vouchsafe thee thy dearest hope. Said the princess, O my mother, my heart is lost to the young man who worketh in the vermicelli baker's shop, and if I fail to be united with him, I shall die of grief. The nurse replied, By Allah, O my lady, he is the fairest of his age, and indeed i lately passed by him as his sleeves were tucked up above his forearms and he ravished my wits i longed to accost him but shame overcame me in presence of those who were around him some buying kunafa and others gazing on his beauty and loveliness his symmetric stature and his perfect grace 
but i o oh my lady will do thee a service and cause thee forgather with him ere long herewith the heart of the princess was solaced and she promised the nurse all good then the old woman left her and fell to devising how she should act in order to bring about a meeting between her and the youth or carry him into the palace so she went to the baker's shop and bringing out an ashrafi said to him take o master this gold piece and make me a platter of vermicelli meet for the best and send it for me by this youth who shall bring it to my home that be near hand i cannot carry it myself quoth the baker in his mind by allah good pay is this gold piece and the kunafa is worth ten silverlings so all the rest is pure profit and he replied on my head and eyes be it o my lady and taking the ashrafi made her a plate of vermicelli and bade his servant bear it to her house so he took it up and accompanied the nurse till she reached the princess's palace when she went in and seated the youth in an out-of-the-way closet then she repaired to her nursling and said rise up o my lady for i have brought thee thy desire the princess sprang to her feet in hurry and flurry and fared till she came to the closet then going in she found the youth who had set down the kunafa and who was standing in expectation of the nurse's return that he and she might wend homewards and suddenly the sultan's daughter came in and bade the youth be seated beside her and when he took seat she clasped him to her bosom of her longing for him and fell to kissing him on the cheeks and mouth ever believing him to be a male masculine till her hot desire for him was quenched then she gave to him two golden dinars and said to him o my lord and cooleth of my eyes do thou come hither every day that we may take our pleasure i and thou he said to hear is to obey and went forth from her hardly believing in his safety for he had learnt that she was the sultan's daughter and he walked till he reached the shop of his employer to whom he gave the twenty dinars now when the baker saw the gold a fright and terror entered his heart and he asked his servants whence the money came and when told of the adventure his horror and dismay increased and he said to himself and this case of ours continue either the sultan will hear that this youth practiseth upon his daughter or she will prove in the family way and will end in our deaths and the ruin of our country the lad must quit this evil path thereupon quoth he to the youth from this time forwards do thou cease faring forth thereto whereat quoth the other i may not prevent myself from going and i dread death and i go not so the man cried do whatso may seem good to thee accordingly the princess in male attire fell to going every morning and meeting the sultan's daughter till one day of the days she went in and the twain sat down and laughed and enjoyed themselves when lo and behold the king entered and as soon as he espied the youth and saw him seated beside his daughter he commanded him be arrested and they arrested him and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventy-eighth night dunyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that when the sultan entered and saw the youth sitting beside his daughter he commanded him to be arrested and they arrested him they also seized the princess and bound her forearms to her sides with straightest bonds then the king summoned the linkman and bade him smite off both their heads 
so he took them and went down with them to the place of execution but when the tidings reached the kunafani he shut up shop without stay and delay and fled presently the sultan said in his mind fain would i question the youth touching his object in entering hither and ask him who conducted to him my daughter and how he won access to her accordingly he sent to bring back the twain and imprisoned them till nightfall then he went in to his harem and caused his daughter's person to be examined and when they inspected her she proved to be a pure maid this made the king marvel for he supposed that the youth must have undone her maidenhead so he sent for him to the presence and when he came he considered him and found him fairer even than his daughter nay far exceeding in her beauty and loveliness so he cried by allah this be a wondrous business verily my daughter hath excuse for loving this youth nor to my judgment doth she even him in charms not the less this affair is a shame to us and the foulest of stains and needs must the twain be done to death to-morrow morning herewith he commanded the jailer to take the youth and to keep him beside him and he shut up the girl with her nurse the jailer forthwith led his charge to the jail but it so happened that its portal was low and when the youth was ordered to pass through it he bent his brow downwards for easier entrance when his turban struck against the lintel and fell from his head the jailer turned to look at him and behold his hair was braided and the plates being loosed gleamed like an ingot of gold he felt assured that the youth was a maiden so he returned to the king in all haste and hurry and cried pardon o our lord the sultan allah pardon us and thee replied the king and the man rejoined o king of the age yonder youth is no boy nay he be a virgin girl quoth the sultan what sayest thou and quoth the other by the truth of him who made thee ruler of the necks of his worshippers o king of the age verily this is a maiden so he bade the prison keeper bring her and set her in his presence and he returned with her right soon but now she paced daintily as the gazelle and veiled her face because she saw that the jailer had discovered her sex the king then commanded them to carry her to the harem whither he followed her and presently having summoned his daughter he questioned her concerning the cause of her union with the so seeming youth herewith she related all that had happened with perfect truth he also put questions to the princess in man's habit but she stood abashed before him and was dumb unable to utter a single word as soon as it was morning the sultan asked of the place where the youth had dwelt and they told him that he lodged with a kunafa baker and the king bade fetch the man when they reported that he had fled however the sultan was insistent in finding him so they went forth and sought him for two days when they secured him and set him between the royal hands he inquired into the youth's case and the other replied by allah o king of the age between me and him were no questionings and i wot not whence may be his origin the monarch rejoined o man thou hast my plighted word for safety so continue thy business as before and now gang thy gate then he turned to the maiden and repeated his inquiries when she made answer saying o my lord my tale is wondrous and my adventures marvellous and what may they be he asked her and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister dunyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and seventy-ninth night section fifteen part four of the story of three sisters and their mother 
the three hundred and seventy-ninth night donyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the princess said to the sultan in very sooth my tale is passing strange and he besought her to recount it so she began to disclose the whole of her history and the adventures which had befallen her and her sisters and their mother especially of the shipwreck in middlemost ocean and of her coming to land after which she told the affair of the wazir burnt by her sire that traitor who had separated children from their father and brief all that had betided them from first to last hearing her soft speech and her strange story the sultan marvelled and his heart inclined her words then he gave her in charge to the palace women and conferred upon her favours and benefits but when he looked upon her beauty and loveliness her brilliancy and perfect grace he fell deeply in love with her and his daughter hearing the accidents which had happened to the princess's father cried by allah the story of this damsel should be chronicled in a book that it become the talk of posterity and be quoted as an instance of the omnipotence of allah almighty for he it is who parteth and scattereth and reuniteth so saying she took her and carried her to her own apartment where she entreated her honourably and the maiden after she had spent a month in the palace showed charms grown twofold and even more at last one day of the days as she sat beside the king's daughter in her chamber about eventide when the sun was hot after a sultry summer day and her cheeks had flushed rosy red behold the sultan entered passing through the room on his way to the harem and his glance unassignedly fell upon the princess who was in home gear and he looked a look of eyes that cost him a thousand sighs so he was astounded and stood motionless knowing not whether to go or to come and when his daughter sighted him in such plight she went up to him and said what hath betided thee and brought thee to this condition quoth he by allah this girl hath stolen my senses from my soul i am fondly enamoured of her and if thou aid me not by asking her in marriage and i fail to wed her twill make my wits go clean bewildered thereupon the king's daughter returned to the damsel and drawing near her said o my lady in light of my eyes indeed my father hath seen thee in thy dishabille and he hath hung all his hopes upon thee so do not thou contrary my words nor the counsel i am about to offer thee and what may that be o my lady asked she and the other answered my wish is to marry thee to my sire and thou be to him wife and he be to thee man but when the maiden heard these words she wept with bitter weeping till she sobbed aloud and cried time hath mastered us and decreed separation i know nothing of my mother and sisters and father and they be dead or on life and whether they were drowned or came to ground then how should i enjoy a bridal fate when they may be in mortal sadness and sorrow but the other ceased not to soothe her and array fair words against her and show her fondly friendship till her soul consented to wedlock presently the other brought out to her what habit befitted the occasion still comforting her heart with pleasant converse after which she carried the tidings to her sire so he sent forthright to summon his lords of the reign and grandees of the realm and the knot was tied between them twain and going in unto her that night he found her a hoard wherefrom the spell had freshly been dispelled and of his longing for her and his desire to her he abode with her two senites never going forth from her or by night or by day hereat the dignitaries of his empire were sore vexed for that their sultan ceased to appear at the divan and deal commandment between man and man and his daughter went in and acquainted him therewith he asked her how long he had absented himself and she answered saying knowest thou how long thou hast tarried in the palace whereto he replied nay fourteen whole days cried she 
whereupon he exclaimed, By Allah, O my daughter, I thought to myself that I had spent with her two days and no more. And his daughter wondered to hear his words. Such was the case of the cadet princess. But as regards the king, the father of the damsel, when he foregathered with the mother of his three daughters, and she told him of the shipwreck and the loss of her children, he determined to travel in search of the three damsels, he and the wazir inhabited as darwishes. And Shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day, and fell silent, and ceased to say her permitted say. Then quoth her sister, Danyazad, How sweet is thy story, O sister mine, and how enjoyable and delectable! Quoth she, and where is this compared with that I would relate to you on the coming night, and the sovereign suffer me to survive? Now when it was the next night, and that was the three hundred and eightieth night, Donyazad said to her, Allah upon thee, O my sister, and thou be other than sleepy. Finish for us thy tale, that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night. She replied, With love and good will, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed, which is benefiting, and of deeds fair seeming, and worthy celebrating, that the sultan resolved to travel in search of his children, the three damsels, he and his wazir, habited as darwishes. So leaving the government in charge of his wife, he went forth, and the twain in their search, first visited the cities on the seaboard, beginning with the nearest but they knew not what was concealed from them in the world of the future. They stinted not travelling for the space of a month, till they came to a city whose sultan had a place height, Aldijla, whereupon he had built a palace. The Darwash is made for it, and found the king sitting in his kiosk, accompanied by two little lads, the elder eight years old, and the second six. They drew near to him, and saluting him offered their services and blessed him, wishing him length of life as is the fashion when addressing royalties. And he returned their greetings, and made them draw near, and showed them kindness. Also, when it was eventide, he bade his men serve them with somewhat of food. On the next day the king fared forth to Tigris Bank, and sat in his kiosk together with the two boys. Now the Darwishes had hired them a cell in the Khan, whence it was their daily wont to issue forth, and wander about the city, asking for what they sought. And this day they again came to the place wherein sat the Sultan, and they marveled at the fair ordinance of the palace. They continued to visit it every day, till one day of the days the two went out, according to their custom, and when entering the palace one of the king's children, which was the younger, came up to them, and fell to considering them as if he had forgotten his own existence. This continued till the Darwishes retired to their cell in the caravansary, whither the boy followed them to carry out the secret purpose existing in the all-knowledge of Allah. When the two sat down, the sultan's son went in to them, and fell to gazing upon them, and solacing himself with the sight when the elder Darwish clasped him to his bosom, and fell to kissing his cheeks, marvelling at his semblance and at his beauty. And the boy in his turn forgot his father and his mother, and took to the old man. Now when as night fell, the sultan retired homewards, fancying that his boy had forgone him to his mother, why the sultana fancied that her child was with his father, and this endured till such time as the king entered the harem. But only the elder child was found there, so the sultan asked, Where is the second boy? And the queen answered, Day by day thou takest them with three to Tigris Bank, and thou bringest them back. But to-day only the elder hath returned. Thereupon they sought him, but found him not, and the mother buffeted her face in grief for her child, and the father lost his right senses. Then the high officials fared forth to search for the king's son, and sought him from early night to the dawn of day, but not finding him, they deemed that he had been drowned in Tigris water. So they summoned all the fishermen and divers, and caused them to drag the river for a space of four days. All this time and the boy abode with the Darwishes, who kept saying to him, Go to thy father and mother. 
but he would not obey them and he would sit with the fakers upon whom all his thoughts were fixed while theirs were fixed upon him this lasted till the fifth day when the doorkeeper unsummoned entered the cell and found the sultan's son sitting with the old men so he went out hurriedly and repairing to the king cried o my sovereign thy boy is with those darwishes who were wont daily to visit thee now when the sultan heard the porter's words he called aloud to his eunuchs and chamberlains and gave them his orders when they ran a race as it were till they entered upon the holy men and carried them from their cell together with the boy and set all four before the sultan the king exclaimed verily these darwishes must be spies and their object was to carry off my boy so he took up his child and clasped him to his bosom and kissed him again and again of his yearning fondness to him and presently he sent him to his mother who was well nigh frantic then he committed the two fakers with commands to decapitate them to the linkman who took them and bound their hands and bared their heads and fell to crying this be his reward and the least of awards who turneth traitor and kidnappeth the sons of the kings and as he cried all the citizens great and small flocked to the spectacle but when the boy heard the proclamation he went forth in haste till he stood before the elder darwish who was still kneeling upon the rug of blood and threw himself upon him at full length till the grandees of his father forcibly removed him then the executioner stepped forward proposing to strike the necks of the two old men and he raised his sword hand till the dark hue of his armpit showed and he would have dealt the blow when the boy again made for the elder faker and threw himself upon him not only once but twice and thrice preventing the sworder's stroke and abode clinging to the old man the sultan cried this darwish is a sorcerer but when the tidings reached the sultana the boy's mother she exclaimed o king needs must this darwish have a strange tale to tell for the boy is wholly absorbed in him so it is not possible to slay him on this wise till thou summon him to the presence and question him i also will listen to him behind the curtain and thus none shall hear him save our two selves the king did her bidding and commanded the old man to be brought so they took him from under the sword and set him before the king and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-first night Danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that at the king's bidding they took up the faker who was still kneeling under the glaive and set him before the king who bade him be seated and when he sat him down the sultan commanded all who were in the presence of eunuchs and chamberlains to withdraw and they withdrew leaving the sovereign with the old religious but the second darwish still knelt in his bonds under the sword of the sworder who standing over against his head kept looking for the royal signal to strike then cried the king o mendicant what drove thee to take my son the core of my heart he replied by allah o king i took him not for mine own pleasure but he would not go from me and i threatened him withal he showed no fear till this destiny distended upon us now when the sultan heard these words his heart softened to the old man and he pitied him while the sultana who sat behind the curtain fell to weeping aloud presently the king said o darwish relate to us thy history for needs must it be a singular but the old man began to shed tears and said o king of the age 
i have a marvellous adventure which were it graven with needle gravers upon the eye corners were a warning to what so would be warned the sultan was surprised and replied what then may be thy history o mendicant and the other rejoined o king of the age i will recount it to thee accordingly he told him of his kingship and the wazir tempting his wife and of her slaying the nurse the slave girls and the eunuch but when he came to this point the sultana ran out in haste and hurry from behind the curtain and rushing up to the darwish threw herself upon his bosom the king seeing this marvelled and in a fury of jealousy clapped hand to hilt crying to the faker this be most unseemly behaviour but the queen replied hold thy hand by allah he is my father and i am his loving daughter and she wept and laughed alternately all of the excess of her joy hereat the king wondered and bade release the second religious and exclaimed sooth he spake who said allah joineth the parted when think the twain with firmest thought ne'er to meet again then the sultana began recounting to him the history of her sire and specially what befell him from his wazir and he when he heard her words felt assured of their truth presently he bade them change the habits of her father and of his wazir and dress them with the dress of kings and he set apart for them an apartment and allotted to them rations of meat and drink so extolled be he who disuniteth and reuniteth now the sultana in question was the youngest daughter of the old king who had been met by the knight when out hunting the same that owed all his fair fortunes to her auspicious coming accordingly the father was assured of having found the lost one and was delighted to note her high degree but after tarrying with her for a time he asked permission of his son-in-law to set out in quest of her two sisters and he supplicated almighty allah to reunite him with the other twain as with this first one thereupon quoth the sultan it may not be save that i accompany thee for otherwise haply some mishap of the world may happen to thee then the three sat down in council debating what they should do and in fine they agreed to travel taking with them some of the lords of the land and chamberlains and nabobs they made ready and after three days they marched out of the city and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-second night donyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the old king marched forth the city accompanied by his son-in-law and his wazir after the sultan had supplied his own place by a vice-regent who would carry out his commandments then they turned to travelling in quest of the two lost daughters and stinted not their wayfare for a space of twenty days when they drew near a city lofty of base and finding a spacious camping plain thereupon pitched their tents the time was set of sun so the cooks applied themselves to getting ready the evening meal and when supper was served up all ate what sufficed them and it was but little because of the travails of travel and they nighted in that sight until morn was high now the ruler of that city was a sultan mighty of might potent of power and exceeding in energy and he was surprised to hear a chamberlain report to him saying o king of the age after an eventless night early this morning we found outside thy capital tents and pavilions with standards and banners planted over against them and all this after the fashion of the kings the sovereign replied there is no help but that to these creations of allah some requirement is here however we will learn their tidings 
so he took horse with his grandees and made for the ensigns and colors and drawing near he noted gravity and majesty in the array and eunuchs and followers and serving men standing ready to do duty then he dismounted and walked till he approached the bystanders whom he greeted with the salaam they salaamed in return and received him with most honorable reception and highmost respect till they had introduced him to the royal shamiana when the two kings rose to him and welcomed him and he wished them long life in such language as is spoken by royalties and all sat down to converse one with other now the lord of the city had warned his people before he fared forth that dinner must be prepared so when it was mid forenoon the farish folk spread the tables with trays of food and the guests came forward one and all and enjoyed their meal and were gladdened then the dishes were carried away for the servants and talk went round till sunset at which time the king again ordered food to be brought and all supped till they had their sufficiency but the sultan kept wondering in his mind and saying would heaven i wot the cause of these two kings coming to us and when night fell the strangers prayed him to return home and to revisit them next morning so he farewelled them and fared forth this lasted three days during which time he honored them with all honor and on the fourth he got ready for them a banquet and invited them to his palace they mounted and repaired thither when he set before them food and as soon as they had fed the trays were removed and coffee and confections and sherbets were served up and they sat talking and enjoying themselves till supper tide when they sought permission to high campwards but the sultan of the city swore them to pass the night with him so they returned to their session till the father of the damsels said let each of us tell a tale that our waking hours may be the more pleasant yes they replied and all agreed in wishing that the sultan of the city would begin now by the decree of the decreer the lattice window of the queen opened upon the place of session and she could see them and hear every word they said he began by allah i have to relate an adventure which befell me and tis one of the wonders of our time quoth they and what may it be and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-third night donyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the sultan of the city said in such a year i had a malady which none availed to medicine until at last an old woman came to me bearing a toss of broth which when i drank caused health return to me so i bade her bring me a cupful every day and i drank it till after a time i chanced to ask her who made that broth and she answered that it was her daughter and one day i assumed a disguise and went to the ancient dame's house and there saw the girl who was a model of beauty and loveliness brilliancy symmetric stature and perfect grace and seeing her i lost my heart to her and asked her to wife she answered how can i wed i separated from my sisters and parents and all unknowing what hath become of them now when the father of the damsels heard these words tears rolled down his cheeks in rills and he remembered his two lost girls and wept and moaned and complained the sultan looking on in astonishment the while and when he went to his queen he found her lying in a fainting fit hereupon he cried out her name and seated her and she on coming to exclaimed by allah he who wept before you is my very father by him who created me i have no doubt thereof 
so the sultan went down to his father-in-law and led him up to the harem and the daughter rose and met him and they threw their arms around each other's necks and fondly greeted each other after this the old king passed the night relating to her what had befallen him while she recounted to him what so hath betided her from first to last whereupon their rejoicings increased and the father thanked almighty allah for having found two of his three children the old king and his sons-in-law and his wazir ceased not to enjoy themselves in the city eating and drinking and making merry for a space of two days when the father asked aidance of his daughter's husbands to seek his third child that the general joy might be perfected this request they granted and resolved to journey with him so they made preparations for travel and issued forth the city together with sundry lords of the land and high dignitaries all taking with them what was required of rations then travelling together in a body they faced the march this was their case but as regards the third daughter she who in man's attire had served the cunifa baker after being married to the sultan his love for her and desire to her only increased and she cohabited with him for a length of time but one day of the days she called to mind her parents and her kith and kin and her native country so she wept with sorest weeping till she swooned away and when she recovered she rose without stay or delay and taking two suits of mameluke's habits patiently waited the fall of night presently she donned one of the dresses and went down to the stables where finding all the grooms asleep she saddled her a stallion of the noblest strain and clinging to the near side mounted him then having supplicated the veiling of the veiler she fared under cover of the glooms for her own land all unweeting the way and when night gave place to day she saw herself amidst mountains and sands nor did she know what she should do however she found on a hill flank some remnants of the late rain which she drank then loosing the girths of her horse she gave him also to drink and she was about to take her rest in that place when lo and behold a lion of bulk and mighty of might drew near her and he was lashing his tail and roaring thunderously and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-fourth night section sixteen part five of the story of three sisters and their mother the three hundred and eighty-fourth night donyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that when the lion advanced to spring upon the princess who was habited as a mameluke and rushed to rend her in pieces she seeing her imminent peril sprang up in haste and bared her blade and met him brand in hand saying or he will slay me or i slay him but as she was hardy of heart she advanced till the two met and fell to fight and struck at each other but the lion waxed furious and gnashed his tusks now retreating and now circuiting around her and then returning to front his foe proposing to claw her when she hardened her heart and without giving ground she swayed her sabre with all the force of her forearm and struck the beast between the eyes and the blade came out gleaming between his thighs and he sank down on earth life forlorn and weltering in his gore presently she wiped her scimitar and returned it to its sheath then drawing up a whittle she came up to the carcass tending to skin it for her own use when behold there towered from afar two dust clouds one from the right and the other from the left 
whereat she withdrew from flaying the lion's fell and applied herself to looking out now by the decree of the decreer the first dust cloud approaching her was that raised by the host of her father and his sons-in-law who when they drew near all stood to gaze upon her and considered her saying in wonderment one to other how can this white slave and he a mere lad have slain this lion single-handed wallahi had that beast charged down upon us he had scattered us far and wide and happily he had torn one of us to pieces by allah this matter is marvellous but the mameluke looked mainly at the old king whom he knew to be his sire for his heart went forth to him meanwhile the second dust cloud approached until those beneath it met the others who had foregone them and behold under it was the husband of the disguised princess and his many now the cause of this king marching forth and coming hither was this when he entered the palace intending for the harem he found not his queen and he fared forth to seek her and presently by the decree of the decreer the two hosts met at the place where the lion had been killed the sultan gazed upon the mameluke and marvelled at his slaying the monster and said to himself now were this white slave mine i would share with him my good and establish him in my kingdom herewith the mameluke came forward and flayed the lion of his fell and gutted him then lighting a fire he roasted somewhat of his flesh until it was sufficiently cooked all gazing upon him the while and marvelling at the hardiness of his heart and when the meat was ready he carved it and setting it upon the sufra of leather said to all present bismillah eat in the name of allah what faith hath given you thereupon all came forward and fell to eating of the lion's flesh except the princess's husband who was not pleased to join them and said by allah i will not eat of this food until i learn the case of this youth now the princess had recognized her spouse from the moment of his coming but she was concealed from him by her mameluke's clothing and he disappeared time after time then returned to gaze upon the white slave eyeing now his eyes now his sides and now the turn of his neck and saying privily in his mind laud to the lord who created and fashioned him by allah this mameluke is the counterpart of my wife in eyes and nose and all his form and features are made likest like unto hers so extolled be he who hath none similar and no equal he was downed in this thought but all the rest ate till they had eaten enough then they sat down to pass the rest of their day and their night in that stead when it was dawn each and every craved leave to depart upon his own business but the princess's husband asked permission to wander in quest of her while the old king the father of the damsels determined to go forth with his two sons-in-law and find the third and last of his lost daughters then the mameluke said to them o my lords sit we down i and you for the rest of the day in this place and to-morrow i will travel with you now the princess for the length of her wanderings which began to when she was a little one had forgotten the semblance of her sire but when she looked upon the old king her heart yearned unto him and she fell to talking with him while he on his part whenever he gazed at her felt like a longing and sought speech of her so the first who consented to the mameluke's proposal was the sire whose desire was not save to sit by her then the rest also agreed to pass the day reposing in that place for that it was a pleasant mead and a spacious garnished with green grass and bright with burgeon and blossom so they took seat there till sundown when each brought out that victual he had and all ate their full and then fell to conversing and presently said the princess o my lords let each of you tell us a tale which he deemeth strange her father broke in saying verily this reed be right and the first to recount will be i for indeed mine is a rare adventure then he began his history telling them that he was born a king and that such and such things had befallen him and so forth until the end of his tale and then the princess hearing his words was certified that he was her sire so presently she said and i too have a strange history 
and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-fifth night Danyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the princess in mameluke's habit said and i too have a strange history then she fell to relating all that had betided her from the very beginning to that which hath before been described and when her father heard it he felt assured that she was his daughter so he arose and threw himself upon her and embraced her and after he veiled her face with the kerchief was with him and her husband exclaimed would to heaven that i also could foregather with my wife quoth she inshallah and that soon and she inclined to him after kindly fashion and said to herself indeed this be my true husband herewith all resolved to march from that stead and they departed the princess's spouse still unknowing that she was his wife and they stinted not faring till they entered the sultan's city and all made for the palace then the princess slipped privily into the harem without the knowledge of her mate and changed her semblance when her father said to her husband hie thee to the woman's apartment haply allah may show to thee thy wife so he went in and found her sitting in her own apartment and he marvelled as he espied her and drew near her and threw his arms around her neck of his fond love to her and asked her concerning her absence thereupon she told him the truth saying i went forth seeking my sire and habited in a mameluke's habit and twas i slew the lion and roasted his flesh over the fire but thou wouldst not eat thereof at these words the sultan rejoiced and his rejoicings increased and all were in the highmost of joy and jolliment he and her father with the other two sons-in-law and this endured for a long while but at last all deemed it suitable to revisit their countries and capitals and each farewelled his friends and the whole party returned safe and sound to their own homes now when it was the next night and that night was the three hundred and eighty-sixth night section seventeen the story of the kazi who bare a babe it hath been related that in terabulous town of syria was a kazi appointed under orders of the caliph harun al-rashid to adjudge lawsuits and dissolve contracts and cross-examine witnesses and after taking seat in his makama his rigor and severity became well known to all men now this judge kept a black handmaiden likest unto a buffalo bull and she cohabited with him for a lengthened while for his nature was ever niggardly nor could any one wrest from him half a fada or any alms-gift or aught else and his diet was of biscuit and onions moreover he was ostentatious as he was miserly he had an eating-cloth bordered with a fine bell fringe and when any person entered about dinner-time or supper-tide he would cry out o oh, handmaid fetch the fringe tablecloth and all who heard his words would say to themselves by allah this must needs be a costly thing presently one day of the days his assessors and officers said to him o our lord the kazi take to thyself a wife for yon negress becometh not a dignitary of thy degree said he and this need be let any who hath a daughter give her to me in wedlock and i will espouse her herewith quoth one present i have a fair daughter and a marriageable whereto quoth the kazi and thou wouldst do me a favour this is the time 
so the bride was fitted out and the espousals took place forthright and that same night the kazi's father-in-law came to him and led him in to his bride saying in his heart i am now connected with the kazi and he took pleasure in the thought for he knew not of the judge's stinginess and he could not suppose but that his daughter would be comfortable with her mate and well-to-do in the matter of diet and dress and furniture such were the fancies which occurred to him but as for the kazi he lay with the maid and abated her maidenhead and she in the morning awaited somewhat wherewith to break her fast and waited in vain presently the kazi left her and repaired to his court-house whither the city folk came and gave him joy of his marriage and wished him good morning saying in themselves needs must he make a mighty fine bride feast but they sat there to no purpose until past noon when each went his own way privily damning the judge's penuriousness as soon as they were gone he returned to his harem and cried out to his black wench o handmaiden fetch the fringed tablecloth and his bride hearing this rejoiced saying to herself by allah his calling for this cloth requireth a banquet which befitteth it food suitable for the kings the negress arose and faring forth for a short time returned with the cloth richly fringed and set upon it a cursey stool and a tray of brass whereon were served three biscuits and three onions when the bride saw this she prayed in her heart saying now may my lord wreak my revenge upon my father but her husband cried to her come hither my girl and the three sat down to the tray wherefrom each took a biscuit and an onion the kazi and the negress ate all their portions but the bride could not swallow even a third of the hard bread apportioned to her so she rose up heartily cursing her father's ambition in her heart at supper-tide it was the same till the state of things became longsome to her and this endured continuously for three days when she was ready to sink with hunger so she sent for her sire and cried aloud in his face the kazi hearing the outcries of his bride asked what is to do whereupon they informed him that the young woman was not in love with this style of living and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-seventh night Danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the bride was not in love with the kazi's mode of living so he took her and cut off her nose and divorced her falsely declaring that she had behaved frowardly on the next day he proposed for another wife and married her and entreated her in like fashion as the first and when she demanded a divorce he shredded off her nostrils and put her away and whatever woman he espoused he starved by his stinginess and tortured with hunger and when any demanded divorce he would chop off her nose on false pretenses and put her away without paying aught either of her marriage settlement or of the contingent dowry at last the report of that kazi's avarice came to the ears of a damsel of mosul city a model of beauty and loveliness who had insight into things hidden and just judgment and skilful contrivance thereupon resolved to avenge her sex she left her native place and journeyed till she made terabulus and by the decree of the decreer at that very time the judge after a day spent in his garden proposed to return home so he mounted his mule and met her halfway between the pleasance and the town he chanced to glance at her and saw that she was wondrous beautiful and lovely symmetrical and graceful and the spittle ran from his mouth wetting his mustachios and he advanced and accosting her said 
o thou noble one whence comest thou hither from behind me kanu i knew that but from what city from mosul art thou single and secluded or femme covert with a husband alive single i am still can it be thou wilt take me and thou become to me mate and i become to thee man if such be our fate twill take place and i will give thee an answer to-morrow and so saying the damsel went on to terabulus now the kazi after hearing her speech felt his love for her increase so next morning he sent to ask after her and when they told him that she had alighted at a khan he dispatched to her the negress his concubine with a party of friends to ask her in marriage notifying that he was kazi of the city thereupon she demanded a dower of fifty dinars and naming a deputy caused the knot be knotted and she came to him about evening time and he went in to her but when it was the supper hour he called as was his wont to his black hand maiden saying fetch the fringe tablecloth and she fared forth and fetched it bringing also three biscuits and three onions and as soon as the meal was served up all three sat down to it the kazi the slave girl and the new bride each took a biscuit and an onion and ate them up and the bride exclaimed allah requite thee with wealth by allah this be a wholesome supper when the judge heard this he was delighted with her and cried out extol be the almighty for that at last he hath vouchsafed to me a wife who thanketh the lord for much or for little but he knew not what the almighty had decreed to him through the wile and guile the malice and mischief of women next morning the kazi repaired to the makamah and the bride arose and solaced herself with looking at the apartments of which some lay open whilst others were closed presently she came to one which was made fast by a door with a wooden bolt and a padlock of iron she considered it and found it strong but at the threshold was a fissure about the breadth of a finger so she peeped through and espied gold and silver coins heaped up in trays of brass which stood upon kersey stools and the nearest about ten cubits from the door she then arose and fetched a long wand the mid-rib of a date palm and arming the end with a lump of leaven she pushed it through the chink under the door and turned it round and round upon the money trays as if sewing or writing at last two dinars stuck to the dough and she drew them through the fissure and returned to her own chamber then calling the negress she gave her the ducat saying go thou to the bazaar and buy us some mutton and rice and clarified butter and do thou also bring us some fresh bread and spices and return with them without delay the negress took the gold and went to the market where she bought all that her lady bade her buy and speedily came back when the kazi's wife arose and cooked a notable meal after which she and the black chattel ate whatso they wanted presently the slave brought basin and ewer to her lady and washed her hands and then fell to kissing her feet saying allah feed thee o my lady even as thou hast fed me for ever since i belong to this kazi i have lacked the necessaries of life replied the other rejoice o handmaiden for henceforth thou shalt have every day naught but the bestest food of manifold kinds and the negress prayed allah to preserve her and thanked her at noon the kazi entered and cried o handmaid fetch the fringed cloth and when she brought it he sat down and his wife arose and served up somewhat of the food she had cooked and he ate and rejoiced and was filled and at last he asked whence this provision she answered i have in this city many kinsfolk who hearing of my coming sent me these meats and quoth i to myself when my lord the kazi shall return home he shall make his dinner thereof on the next day she did as before and drawing out three ducats called the slave girl and gave her two of them bidding her go to the bazaar and buy a lamb ready skinned and a quantity of rice and clarified butter and greens and spices and whatso was required for dressing the dishes so the handmaid went forth rejoicing and bought all her lady had ordered 
and forthwith returned when her mistress fell to cooking meats of various kinds and lastly sent to invite all her neighbors women and maidens when they came she got ready the trays garnished with dainty food and served up to them all that was suitable and they ate and enjoyed themselves and made merry now this was about mid forenoon but as midday drew near they went home carrying with them dishes full of dainties which they cleared and washed and sent back till everything was returned to its place and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister Danyazad, how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-eighth night Danyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the guests of the kazi's wife fared from her before turn of sun and when it was noon behold the kazi entered his harem and said o handmaiden fetch the fringed tablecloth when the wife arose and set before him viands of various sorts he asked whence they came and she answered saying this is from my maternal aunt who has sent it as a present to me the judge ate and was delighted and abode in the harem till set of sun but his wife ceased not daily to draw money from his hoard and to expend it upon entertaining her friends and gossips and this endured for a whole year now beside her mansion dwelt a poor woman in a mean dwelling and every day the wife would feed her and her husband and babes moreover she would give them all that sufficed them the woman was far gone with child and the other charged her saying as soon as tis thy time to be delivered do thou come for me for i have a mind to play a prank upon this kazi who feareth not allah and who whenever he taketh to himself a wife first depriveth her of food till she is well nigh famished then shreddeth off her nose under false pretences and putteth her away taking all her belongings and giving naught of dower either the precedent or the contingent and the poor woman replied to hear is to obey then the wife persisted in her lavish expenditure till her neighbour came to her already overtaken by birth pains and these lasted but a little while when she was brought to bed of a boy hereupon the kazi's wife arose and prepared a savoury dish called a besara the base of which is composed of beans and gravied mallows seasoned with onions and garlic it was noon when her husband came in and she served up the dish and he being a hungered ate of it and ate greedily and at supper time he did likewise but he was not accustomed to a basera so as soon as night came on his paunch began to swell the wind bellowed in his bowels his stress was such that he could not be more distressed and he roared out in his agony herewith his wife ran in and cried to him no harm shall befall thee o my lord and so saying she passed her hand over his stomach and presently exclaimed extolled be he o my lord verily thou art pregnant and a babe is in thy belly and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister Danyazad, how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and eighty-ninth night Danyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding 
lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that the kazi's wife came up to him and passing her palm over his paunch presently cried extol be he o my lord verily thou art pregnant and a babe is in thy belly quoth the kazi how shall a man bear a child and quoth she allah createth whatso he willeth and as they two sat at talk the flatulence and bellyache increased and violent colic set in and the torments waxed still more torturing then the wife rose up and disappeared but presently she returned with her pauper neighbor's newly born babe in her sleeve its mother accompanying it she also brought a large basin of copper and she found her husband rolling from right to left and crying aloud in his agony at last the qualms in his stomach were ready to burst forth and the rich food to issue from his body and when this delivery was near at hand the wife privily set the basin under him like a close stool and fell to calling up the holy names and to shampooing and rubbing down his skin while she ejaculated the name of allah be upon thee but all this was of her malice at last the prima via opened and the kazi let fly whereat his wife came quickly behind and setting the babe upon its back gently pinched it so that it began to wail and said o man alhamdulillah laud to the lord who hath so utterly relieved thee of thy burden and she fell to muttering names over the newborn then quoth he have a care of the little one and keep it from cold draughts for the trick had taken completely with the kazi and he said in his mind allah createth whatso he willeth even if men so predestined can bring forth and presently he added o woman look out for a wet nurse to suckle him and she replied o my lord the nurse is with me in the woman's apartments then having sent away the babe and its mother she came up to the kazi and washed him and removed the basin from under him and made him lie at full length presently after taking thought he said o woman be careful to keep this matter private for fear of the folk who otherwise might say our kazi hath borne a babe she replied o my lord as the affair is known to other than our two selves how can we manage to conceal it and after she resumed o my husband this business can no no wise be hidden from the people for more than a week or at most till next month herewith he cried out o my calamity if it reach the ears of folk and they say our kazi hath borne a babe then what shall we do he pondered the matter until morning when he rose before daylight and taking some provant secretly made ready to depart the city saying o allah suffer none to see me then after giving his wife charge of the house and bidding her take care of his effects and farewelling her he went forth secretly from her and journeyed that day and a second and a third until the seventh when he entered damascus of syria where none knew him but he had no spending money for he could not persuade himself to take even a single dinar from his hoard and he had provided himself with naught save the meagrest provision so his condition was straitened and he was compelled to sell somewhat of his clothes and lay out the price upon his urgent needs and when the coin was finished he was forced to part with other portions of his dress till little or nothing of it remained to him then in his sorest strait he went to the sheikh of the masons and said to him o master my wish is to serve this industry and said he welcome to thee so the kazi worked through every day for a wage of five fadas such was his case but as regards his wife and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and ninetieth night danyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy 
Finish for us thy tale, that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night. She replied, With love and good will. It hath reached me, O auspicious king, the director, the right guiding, lord of the reed, which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating, that when the Kazi went forth from his wife, she threw a shirt behind him and muttered, Allah never bring thee back from thy journey. Then she arose and threw open the rooms, and noted all that was in them of monies and movables, and vassal and rarities, and she fell to feeding the hungry, and clothing the naked, and doling alms to fakers, saying, This be the reward of him who mortifieth the daughters of folk, and devoureth their substance, and shreddeth off their nostrils. She also sent to the women he had married and divorced, and gave them of his good the equivalent of their dowers and a solatium for loosing their noses. And every day she assembled the good wives of the quarter, and cooked for them manifold kinds of food, because her spouse the Kazi was possessed of property approaching two kasnas of money, he being ever loath to expand what his hand could hand, and unprepared to part with aught on any wise for the excess of his niggardness and his greed of grain. Nor did she cease from doing so for a length of time, until suddenly she overheard folk saying, Our cause hath borne a babe. And such brute spread abroad, and was reported in sundry cities, nor ceased the rumor ere it reached the ears of the caliph Harun al-Rashid in Baghdad city. Now hearing it, he marveled and cried, Extolled be Allah! This hap, by the Lord, never can have happened save at the hand of some woman, a wise and a clever at contrivance, nor would she have wrought after such fashion save to make public somewhat curse proceeding from the Kazi, either his covetous intent or his high-handedness in commandment. But needs must this good wife be summoned before me and recount the cunning practice she hath practised. Allah grant her success in the prank she hath played upon the judge. Such was her case, but as concerns the Kazi, he abode working at builder's craft till his bodily force was enfeebled and his frame became frail. So presently he quoth to himself, Do thou return to thy native land, for a long time hath now passed, and this affair is clean forgotten. Thereupon he returned to Terabulus. But as he drew near thereto, he was met outside the city by a bevy of small boys, who were playing at forfeits. And lo and behold, cried one to his comrades, O oh, lads, do you remember such and such a year when our Kazi was brought to bed? But the judge, hearing these words, returned forthright to Damascus by the way he came, saying to himself, Hide thee not save to Baghdad city, for tis further away than Damascus, and set out at once for the house of peace. However he entered it privily, because he was still in the employ of the prince of true believers, Harun al-Rashid, and changing semblance and superficials, he donned the dress of a Persian darwish, and fell to walking about the streets of the capital. Here met he sundry men of high degree, who showed him favor, but he could not venture himself before the caliph, albeit sundry of the subjects, said to him, O Darwish, why dost thou not appear in the presence of the commander of the faithful? Assuredly he would bestow upon thee many a boon, for he is a true sultan. And specially, and thou panegyrest him in poetry, he will largely add to his largesse. Now by decree of the destiny of the vice-regent of Allah upon his earth, and commanded the Kazi's wife to be brought from Terabulus. So they led her into the presence, and when she had kissed the ground before him, and salaamed to him, and prayed for the perpetuity of his glory and his existence, he asked her anent her husband, and how he had borne a child, and what was the prank she had played him, and in what manner had she gotten the better of him. She hung her head groundwards for a while for shame, nor could she return aught of reply for a time, when the commander of the faithful said to her, Thou hast my promise of safety, and again safety, the safety of one who betrayeth not his word. So she raised her head and cried, By Allah, O king of the age, the story of this Kazi is a strange. 
and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and ninety-first night Danyazad said to her allah upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that quoth the kazi's wife by allah o king of the age the story of this kazi is a strange and of the wonders of the world and tis as follows my spouse is so niggardly of nature and greedy of grain that whatso wife he weddeth he starveth her with hunger and when as she loseth patience he shreddeth her nostrils and putteth her away taking all her good and what not now this case continued for a while of time also he had a black slave wench and a fine eating cloth and when dinner time came he would cry o handmaid fetch the fringed tablecloth whereupon she would bring it and garnish it with three biscuits and three onions one to each mouth presently accounts of this conduct came to me at mosul whereupon i removed me to terabulus and there played him many a prank amongst which was the dish of a sar by me seasoned with an over quantity of onions and garlic and such spices as gather wind in the maw and distend it like a tom-tom and breed borbury gems this i gave him to eat and then befell that which befell so i said to him thou art in the family way and tricked him privily bringing into the house a new-born babe when his belly began to drain off i set under him a large metal basin and after pinching the little one i placed in it the utensil and recited names over it presently quoth he guard my little stranger from the draught and bring hither a wet nurse and i did accordingly but he waxed ashamed of the birth and in the morning he fared forth the city nor knew we what allah had done with him but as he went i bespake him with the words which the poet sang when the ass of um Amr went off ass and um Amr be went their way nor ass nor um Amr returned for i and then i cited the saying of another when i forced him to fare i bade him high where um kasham caused her selly to fly and now as the caliph harum al-rashid heard these words he laughed so hearty a laugh that he fell backwards and bade the good wife repeat her story till he waxed distraught for the excess of merriment when lo and behold a darwish suddenly entered the presence the wife looked at her husband and recognized him but the caliph knew not his kazi so much had time and trouble changed the judge's cheer however she signalled to the commander of the faithful that the beggar was her mate and he taking the hint cried out welcome to thee o darwish and where be the babe thou bearest at terabulus the unfortunate replied o king of the age do men go with child and the prince of true believers rejoined we heard that the kazi bear a babe and thou art that same kazi now habited in faker's habit but who may be this woman thou seest he made answer i wot not but the dame exclaimed why this denial o thou who fearest allah so little i conjure thee by the life of the king to recount in his presence all that betided thee he could deny it no longer so he told his tale before the caliph who laughed at him aloud and at each adventure the king cried out allah spare thee and thy child o kazi thereupon the judge explained saying pardon o king of the age i merit even more than that what hath betided me and shahrazad was surprised by the dawn of day and fell silent and ceased to say her permitted say then quoth her sister danyazad how sweet is thy story o sister mine and how enjoyable and delectable quoth she 
and where is this compared with that i would relate to you on the coming night and the sovereign suffer me to survive now when it was the next night and that was the three hundred and ninety-second night donyazad said to her howl upon thee o my sister and thou be other than sleepy finish for us thy tale that we may cut short the watching of this our latter night she replied with love and good will it hath reached me o auspicious king the director the right guiding lord of the reed which is benefiting and of deeds fair seeming and worthy celebrating that quoth the kazi to the king i deserve even more than what hath betided me for my deeds were unrighteous o ruler of the time but now the twain of us be present between thy hands so do thou of thy generous grace and the perfection of thy beneficence then reconcile me unto my wife and from this moment forwards i repent before the face of allah nor will i ever return to the condition i was in of niggardacy and greed of grain but tis for her to decide and on whatever wise she direct me to act therein i will not gainsay her and do thou vouchsafe for me the further favour of restoring me to the office i wilhelm held when the prince of true believers harun al-rashid heard the kazi's words he turned to the judge's wife and said thou also hast heard what thy mate hath averred so do thou become to him what thou wast before and thou hast command over all which thy husband requireth she replied o king of the age even as thou hast the advantage of knowing verily the heavens and the son of adam change not for that man's nature is never altered except with his existence nor doth it depart from him save when his life departeth however and he speak the truth let him bind himself by a deed documented under thy personal inspection and thine own seal so that if he break his covenant the case may be committed to thee the caliph rejoined sooth thou sayest that the nature of adam's son is allied to his existence but the kazi exclaimed o our lord the sultan bid write for me the writ even as thou hast heard from her mouth and do thou deign witness it between us twain thereupon the king reconciled their differences and allotted to them a livelihood which would suffice and sent them both back to terabulous town this is all that hath come down to us concerning the kazi who bear a babe yet is as not compared with a tale of the bang eaters for their story is wondrous and their adventures delectable and marvellous what may it be asked shariar so shahrazad began to recount the tale of the kazi and the bang-eater